It's difficult.
Then it is nothing new. It has to my estate. We'll wait a few more minutes. People are still coming in. And there are. Okay, I think we're going to start. Uh, we're only five minutes late. Uh, people are still coming in. Uh, so please, if you come in, come in without making too much noise. Um, thank you for attending and for being here after lunch. Uh, we thank AUIS, uh, which I'm proudly a board member of, for organizing this. And we wish the university a lot of success. We have a very important panel here. We've been talking about politics, pra practically, and, relig and, and, and religion, and uh, border relationships for the past couple of days. Um, and m I, coming from finance and business thing, this is more important than anything we discussed. If we can imagine this forum 20 years from now, and what will be the subject being discussed? Forum 22. If, things are, if we do things correctly, we'll be discussing art, philosophy, effect of religion on, psych on psychology, etc. If we do things wrongly, we won't be discussing anything because there will be no Soleimania Forum in 22 years. I'm afraid from the business point of view, I think we're not doing things right. The idea of a centralized economy. Centralized economy is bankrupt. We ha what we do <clears throat> today, what we have done for the past 10 years, is export oil to import yogurt. That cannot last. The population is growing. It cannot last. The other day, we opened the beautiful new hotel in Suleymaniyam, uh, the Millennium the Grand Millennium Hotel, in the opening of the hotel, uh, His Excellency Nachuan Barzani said that our government should not be asked to, to provide employment for everyone. No government in the world is asked to provide employment for everyone. Um, His Excellency Fuad Hussein yesterday mentioned that the era of centralized, the central, centralized directing, directed economies are gone. I would like, I completely agree with him, I would like to add to that, that that centrali centralization, whether it's Baghdad, Erbil, Suleymaniyah, or Kirkuk, has to be gone. Um, the idea of private sector and the right, unalienable right of everyone to pursue happiness is enshrined in the American Constitution. I wish one of my politicians wrote that, but no, it was written by Thomas Jefferson. 
That simple idea today is $13 trillion economy. <clears throat> However we agree or disagree with the American policies, they gave us the car, they gave us the plane, they gave us electricity, and to all of you young people in the back, they gave us the identity. <clears throat> and this university is called American University of Iraq. So there is something they have done correctly there. Ladies and gentlemen, we have 60% of the population that is under the age of 20. Okay? We need to create jobs. And it is not, I repeat, it is not the government that will be able to do that. It is the private sector. So without going too much more into it, I would like to go into my panel, which presents people who actually invested in Iraq the realities of these investments in Iraq, what they have suffered from investing in Iraq, <coughs> and why the, the, the, the government does not provide good means for investment. But first, we'd like to go with a success story to Kak Farouk and his investment in the region. I've known Kak Farouk for 15 years, and the first time I met him, he walked into my office in Istanbul with Kakiwa, and he said, I'm going to do a mobile operators in Iraq. This is not year 1999. <coughs> <coughs> to say the least, I laughed. Iraq was under, under American sanctions. How could you start a mobile operator in Iraq? I never laugh at anything Kak Farouk says anymore, however crazy it sounds, because he can do it. So, Kak Farouk, please talk about your success stories. I'm going to talk about Arabic. I'm going to talk about Arabic and English. I'm going to talk about Arabic. I'm going to talk about Arabic. طويلة وتمثل نجاح مستثمرين عراقيين في مرحلة عصيبة من مراحل الوضع السياسي في العراق في سنوات ما بعد 1995 و96 بدأنا بأعمال بسيطة في مجال الاتصالات وفي سنة 1999 وقبل ذلك الحقيقة أنا شفت أول مرة الموبايل في لندن كنت في راقد في مستشفى لإجراء عملية باي باس في القلب بالتأكيد شفت الموبايل ما كنت شايف الموبايل فشجعني الموبايل والاهتمام بالموبايل ودور الموبايل في الاتصالات وفي جميع أمور الحياة أن أبحث عن الموبايل وكيفية البدء اتصلنا من المستشفى أنا اتصلت ببعض الشركات أكثرهم رفضوا لأن العراق كان حصار اقتصادي على كردستان وحصار اقتصادي على العراق كردستان الحقيقة كان, كان علينا حصارين فكان من الصعب وقسم الحقيقة كانوا يستهزئون بالحديث عن الموبايل في كردستان والعراق ذكر الأخشوان وهو كان الحقيقة مساعدا لنا كأخ وصديق طبعا فبدأنا بالاتصال بتركسيل تركسيل دزولنا للاتصال الشخص الرابع أو الخامس ما أدري فت من هالنوع فهم أيضا ما ما صار على أي اتفاق تجهنا فيما بعد باختصار إلى شركة كندية أمريكية شركة صغيرة كان اسمها تيلوس اشتغلنا على هذا الموضوع وقدرنا أن نستورد أجهزة ومعدات لنيتورك صغير بعد ذلك صار من 2001 بدأنا بالاتصالات بشركات كبيرة أول شركة اتصلنا بشركة هواوي الصينية فأيضا هم كانوا خايفين من الوضع في العراق وعدم قبول السلطة ذاك الوقت بجلب معدات اتصالات بالأساس 
الى كردستان <تصفيق> لان كان اكو حكومه كردستان المحليه بتركيا توسعت العمل بعد الحقيقه بعد سقوط النظام البائد وصارت الاتصالات قويه مع شركه هواوي وانا الحقيقه ابين فشيء مهم جدا ذاك الوقت ان ناس انا وزملاء لي عدد قليل كنا الموبايل كنا تاثر ذاك الوقت لو مال الملك لو مال الامير لو مال العوائل الكبيره في مصر والكويت والسعوديه والهاي ف دائما اني اشجع الزملاء والاصدقاء للشجاعه والجراه في العمل وبمبالغ قليله تمكنا وديون تمكنا من استيراد الموبايل عن طريق تركيا ومن تركيا الى كردستان. حديث طويل بس اسيا سيل هسه تعتبر شركه اسيا سيل هسه اقوى شركه واهم شركه اتصالات في العراق ومن ناحيه الارباح الشركه الوحيده اللي ارباحنا واضحه وجيده ومن ناحيه الكفرج احنا اسيا سيل نغطي بال 197 من الاراضي المسكونه في العراق وكذلك اسيا سيل تساهم في في الاسواق ولاول مره وقبل عام واحد دخلنا في سوق الاوراق الماليه وكاول شركه اتصالات ولحد الان والاكتتاب الاول اللي قمنا ب كان اكتتاب اول ناجح وكان الاول الاكتتاب الاول منذ 2008 في منطقه الشرق الاوسط والاول في العراق في التاريخ لان يعني خلال فتره قصيره تمكنا من بيع جميع الاسهم. اسيا سيل تعني بالنسبه لنا شركه شركه وطنيه وبجهود وطنيه جلبنا بالتاكيد اول مره وهذه النقطه مهمه جدا الخبره والاموال الخبره ما كان اكو خبره اتصالات في العراق. أه تمكنا من أه استيراد الخبرات قبل الاموال وقبل الاجهزه. وحاليا نقدر أه نقول ان المسائل الاساسيه في اسيا سير اللي عندنا 11 مليون مشترك ونغطي كل العراق أه اداره عراقيه فنيا واداريا وحتى تجاريا. قد تصد اسيا سيل قابله للاطاله ولكن انا في قضايا اخرى كانت على الطاوله موضوع الاستثمار في كردستان وفي العراق. انا وشركتنا فاروق جروب وزملاء اخرين ايضا من اسيا سيل ومن الشركات الاخرى نعتبر نفسنا المستثمرين او الاول او المستثمرين الاوائل في العراق حجما ونوعيه. نوعيه اهتمينا بالصناعات ولاول مره في كردستان قمنا باعاده تاهيل معمل سمنتا سلوجه كاول عمل في العراق بعد سقوط النظام. وبعد معمل طاسلوجه انشانا معمل اخر ويمثل اكبر خط في الشرق الاوسط في خط كخط واحد لينتج 7500 طن سمنت واستمرنا في الاستثمار ودائما امامي المهم جلب الخبر خبرات قبل الاموال وقبل الاجهزه وتمكنا من فتح تريننج سنتر في شركه اسيا سيل ب وتخرجوا من هل مركز اكثر من 600 واحد في مختلف مجالات من فنيه وماركتينغ وسيلز وجميع المجالات انا اقدر اقول نحن نساهم ونساهم وللاخير في بناء بلدنا ونحن انا بالذات اتكلم باسمي ليس لي اي مشروع خارج كردستان فقط اسيا سيل في كل العراق 
واهتمامي الاساسي في مدينه في محافظه سليمانيه ومدينه سليمانيه لافتقارها الى الكثير من المشاريع المهمه ونحن بنينا اكثر من 10 او بين 10 و15 مشروع اكثرها مشاريع صناعيه وسياحيه وزراعيه ارجو ان نتمكن من ال استمرار في هذا العمل بالتأكيد بالنسبة للاستثمار لا يجب أن أؤشر أن قانون الاستثمار في كردستان وقانون الاستثمار في العراق قانون جيد على طريق على الطريق الصحيح الاستثمار يساعد يساعد المستثمرين بشكل جيد وأنا أتكلم في استثمار كردستان وبالذات استثمار سليمانية بعيدين من بالأساس من الروتين القاتل. الروتين الموجود في جميع دوائر الدولة الروتين اللي يولد الفساد المالي والإداري فإن شاء الله نتمكن من التوسع إلى مناطق بغداد وجنوب العراق في مشاريع صناعية مختلفة وبنينا نحن مستشفى هذه المستشفى يعتبر هذا المستشفى المستشفى الجيد ونوعيا أحسن مستشفى في الشرق الأوسط كما يعترف بهذا جميع الزوار من أطباء ومن ناس ناس فنيين المستشفى أملنا أن نفتتح مستشفى آخر في بغداد أو في البصرة في الأشهر القريبة القادمة ليعم هذا الخير كما يقولون جميع مناطق العراق شكرا uh, First, I'd like to plug in my firm. Rabia Security actually did the Asia Cell deal in Iraq, which was the largest deal in the Middle East in the past five years. Uh, but now, from very happy investment to one foreign investment that is not so happy. Um, I, uh, I was sitting in my office when uh, uh, Esra and her father came to tell me that they have invested in Baghdad. I was very happy to hear somebody actually has put money in Baghdad, a foreigner has put money in Baghdad in a factory. And uh, the more they spoke, you know, the worse the story became. Uh, it is the fir first investment in Baghdad that actually got a MIGA uh, insurance. MIGA is political insurance by the IFC, and they, this is the first project that got that. Um, uh, however, they actually wanted to sell the investment. Uh, so, Esra, please tell us your experience. Uh, well, definitely the success of Asia Sahel will be hard to follow, but uh, <laughs> this will provide a different perspective. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I said definitely the success of Asia Sahel is uh, very difficult to follow but uh, this will provide a different perspective. Um, I want to uh, state, first of all, that our experience has been mainly uh, with the central government of Iraq and with Baghdad, and we have not had any uh, experience here in the KRG, so uh, please uh, keep that in mind. Um, I'll start with how, first of all, this project came about. Uh, I work with my family, with my father. Uh, we are doing uh, chemicals and petrochemicals and oil products trading. And uh, we have been doing that for about 35 years. Uh, since the 80s, our company had been supplying Iraq with uh, raw materials for industry as well as petrochemical products. So we were quite familiar with the country and uh, we liked working here in the past. And uh, after the war, we said, okay, uh, let's go back. Uh, our contacts also reached out to us, and we said, okay, what can we do now? And uh, we looked at the investment law, which had been issued at the time, and uh, we met with the investment authority, and uh, we decided to do something in manufacturing. We said, everybody is trying to sell something to Iraq from Turkey but we need to go one step further and maybe try to do something in Iraq. Uh, this will be good for business and uh, you know, it will be good also for the country. 
We looked into uh, several things and uh, coming from the petrochemical sector, we decided to manufacture PET preforms. PET preforms are, uh, they look like little test tubes. Uh, they are purchased by beverage companies. The beverage companies blow these into bottles, the water bottles or, uh, you know, soft drink bottles that you use, and then they fill them. Um, we thought, you know, uh, let's go ahead with this. Uh, water is important. Uh, we uh, obtained, as Swan said, uh, uh, political risk insurance from MIGA. We said this will cover us in case of, you know, violence or um, any political issue in the country. We were the first ones to get political risk insurance. At the time, this was quite new, uh, but it was quite interesting for us as investors. Um, and uh, we went ahead. Uh, we uh, set up the factory. It was operational by the second half of 2010. Uh, the first, uh, you know, the first lines were installed, and the project was actually in two phases. Um, and uh, 2000, you know, we had some delays with the equipment and all of that. But okay, we start in 2010 with the first part of the project. Um, at the time, this was really, I think, one of the few projects that were directly investing in Iraq. And uh, we said, you know, are we crazy? But no, there were several advantages, we thought, to investing in Iraq. The first is that, you know, drinking water is necessary and beverages are necessary and demand will be there under any political or economic situation. So it's quite a stable product. Um, the second is that there were almost no local production of uh, these preforms, uh, so there wasn't so much competition. Uh, we knew that, you know, stability and prosperity would increase and the youth, uh, the demographics in Iraq would uh, lead to the consumption of a lot of uh, beverages. Um, so we said, okay, these are really good strategic points. Um, we found a good site uh, close to Baghdad in a secured zone by the Ministry of Trade, so location is good. Um, we imported the best equipment from Canada. The machinery is good, no problems, hopefully, with the machinery. Um, and, uh, you know, power generation was a key issue, so we got what we thought, you know, the best generators. We don't want to have any problems. Um, so all of that looked quite positive. Uh, and the only competition, in fact, was uh, the, the preforms that were being imported mainly from Turkey. And, you know, we looked at the economics. Uh, producing them in Iraq was going to give us a, quite a beneficial situation compared to the imports. Um, so we went ahead. And, uh, you know, this is all the great part, the good part of the story. But what did we face uh, when we got to... Uh, to working on the ground. Uh, somehow we found it very difficult to find a um, good Iraqi partner to work with. Um, we didn't have the same business ideas, the same understanding. Uh, we were thinking longer term. So at the end, we decided to buy out all of our uh, partners and we decided to stay on our own. Um, the lack of power supply really was problematic for us. Uh, even though we had, you know, sufficient generators, it's very costly. Um, getting the fuel is quite expensive. The quality, uh, you know, stopping a factory is the worst thing that you can do in uh, production. It, co it affects all your costs, and this had to happen, has to happen quite often still because uh, of the lack of power. So. Um, uh, other than that, one of the problems was also uh, the lack of trained professionals. We couldn't, for example, find people who spoke English, but who were also good at accounting and th these sorts of things. Uh, so we decided to hire people who spoke English and we trained them ourselves. Uh, you know, we brought people from Turkey, technical people, uh, commercial people. Um, and, uh, you know, from time to time, we did go to the government uh, with uh, some of the problems we had, and whoever we went to in the senior government was very helpful, tried to do their best, and we thanked them. And in fact, they did maybe resolve some of our problems, but 
you know, speaking from someone who's senior, then the implementation has to be done by uh, the more junior people who, who need to work on the things. And we found that there is really a lack of institutional capacity and uh, a lack of uh, knowledge and institutional background to be able to do some of the, even the basic things. So, um, and last but not least, you know, the security was especially around 2009 and 10 a concern a concern for the expats who were working for us, a cost uh, to have them, to, to provide security for them. And um, it's unfortunately becoming a concern again uh, with the latest uh, surge in violence. Um, where are we now? What have we learned from this? Uh, you know, I cannot stress enough the importance of a local partner. Um, I think it's not, evident to find a good local partner right away, uh, but maybe it makes things easier. Um, I'm seeing that maybe we were too early. I see that things are progressing now. Uh, the markets are developing. People are doing much better as far as trading, as far as banking relations and using the banks and the infrastructure. Um, consumer uh, use is increasing. Uh, for example, in the beverage industry, you know, where we deal on a daily basis, we really see a move from small producers to larger and more established producers who have better machinery, who are, I mean, pe Iraqi people are really investing, and uh, we hope that this will continue. Um, right now, uh, where we are at this point in the project, actually, is quite uh, important for us. Uh, we have not, as I said in the beginning, implemented the second phase uh, of the project. Uh, the second phase will actually make the project much more profitable due to the economics. But, um, you know, we are not sure whether to go forward because we don't see the problems necessarily re being resolved right away and we're not sure whether we'll be able to get to the full potential uh, that the project has. Um, so on one hand, you know, and there are Iraqi companies interested to buy the factory. So on one hand, we are thinking, okay, we, you know, cash out, we leave, and uh, we leave this to Iraqis, and they can probably work better uh, on this. On the other hand, especially thanks to this mega insurance, we have foreign investors who want to invest in us because they say, you know, you're, you're, a good intermediate compromise for us. You understand Western business, so we want to invest with you. But we, I mean, it is a question whether we really feel confident that we can grow this. Um, and I think time will tell. So I'll conclude with that. Good. Uh, I, think, I think everybody from the government is very apologetic for all your problems, but uh, let's hope that they could solve something. Um, Ashra and her family from Turkey did not have to invest in Iraq, but they chose to. My next guest, Ziad, they actually have a mandate to invest in Iraq, and they have a lot of money. <coughs> I have seen is, is the private arm of, of the World Bank Group. And, and, and uh, they have, I think, I don't know how much, I'm not going to say it because I hear different numbers, but a lot of money to invest in Iraq into businesses, private businesses. Yet, they're facing problems giving money to Iraq. So I would like to, Ziad, to, I think he's going to, he has a presentation, so he's going to go to the podium. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like first to thank the American University for, offer me, for offering me this uh, opportunity. And um, just going through my presentation quickly, I would like to start with an introduction of uh, IFC and what we do, uh, our activities in Iraq. And uh, for the sake of time, I'll try to go through them uh, quickly. Then I will focus on our strategy on, uh, on Iraq uh, you mentioned we have a mandate to invest. Our mandate is to invest in projects that are profitable. It doesn't have to be in a specific country. So it is uh, opportunities that present themselves. So I will talk about uh, our uh, strategy and the focus uh, in our strategy. 
And then uh, I will uh, finish by talking about the challenges that are facing international investors like IFC in investing in uh, Iraq. Uh, the World Bank Group has uh, five different organizations. You have the World Bank for uh, Reconstruction, uh, which provide loans and uh, technical assistance and grants to government. Uh, IFC is the arm of the World Bank that deal with the private sector. Uh, we already mentioned MIGA, our multilateral investment guarantee agencies, and there is other agencies in the bank. Uh, the World Bank Group is owned by 181 countries, and um, I'm happy to say that Iraq was among the 40 countries that signed on the establishment of the World Bank Group back in 1945. So uh, Iraq is an establishing uh, uh, country. What does IFC do? Uh, IFC is the only global multilateral institution that is focused, as I mentioned, exclusively on the private sector. We are the global leader in private sector development, and we are the largest investor in emerging market. Our investment exceeds $45 billion. We facilitate transfer of knowledge, we bring expertise and we introduce, we introduce best industry practice when we get involved in an investment. Uh, IFC is highly decentralized with over 100 offices in 86 countries. When IFC look at an, uh, an investment, we really look at the developmental impact of the project we're dealing with before we even look at the profit of the project because we are the arm of the World, uh, of the world Bank. We focus also on uh, market pricing policies. So basically, we try not to compete with the private sector. Our role is not really to uh, uh, put the private sector out of business. So we follow market pricing. Uh, our relationship with our clients is long term. When we go into uh, uh, an investment, we're looking at 10 to 12 years uh, partnership. Our role is counter cyclical when usually investors leave the market like the financial crisis in 2009, we usually comes, uh, we come in. Uh, we take uh, risk when we involve in those markets, but it's definitely uh, calculated uh, uh, risk. And, by the way, we do not accept government guarantee in our investment. IFC has two arms. It has the advisory arm and the investment arm. Under the advisory arm, with the accumulated knowledge that IFC had for the last 50 or 60, or 60 years, we advise in four main areas. One is access to finance, where we also advise uh, central banks. Uh, and with our advisory, by the way, we deal with both public and private sector. So we advise central bank, uh, private banks, uh, insurance companies, and so on. Uh, investment climate, investment climate where we try to help countries identify uh, uh, uh, bottlenecks and uh, challenges that investors face to invest in any country, and we try to improve the investment uh, climate. Uh, PPP, where uh, we are the only international organization that work on the bankability of a private-public uh, partnership. We take the deal to the market. For example, Amman Airport is one of the uh, projects that uh, IFC have dealt with. Um, Egypt, uh, we have Cairo Wastewater is one of our PPP projects. Alexandria Hospital is one of them. Sustainable business, this is where we give advice on something like uh, green code uh, for buildings and so on. On the financial side, we give uh, long-term loans. We could go into equity shares and we provide guarantees. And also through our uh, uh, AMC, our asset management company, we could also do asset management. Uh, IFC portfolio so far in Iraq is around $700 million. We have 10% equity share in the credit bank of uh, Iraq. Uh, 
uh, we have 29 million loan for uh, the Erbil Rotana. We put 15 million with the Erbil Rotania, which was the first five-star hotel in, in Iraq. And we extended that by another 21 million for a Rotana Arjan, also in Kurdistan. We invested $135 million with Gulf Tainer. It's an Iraqi Emirati company. It runs uh, uh, container berths in the Umm Qasr port. We have our largest investment is with Zain, uh, Iraq. We have $400 million in a syndication uh, with Zain. We have a partnership with Lafarge, so we invested $50 million with the Farouk group also in the Bazian cement factory. And uh, 75 million in the Karbala cement factory. We uh, also got a 10% share in the commercial bank of uh, Iraq. Our target investment in the coming three years is to invest between 800 and 1 billion dollar. Knowing that usually IFC direct investment does not exceed 20% of the total size of a project, we should be able to uh, mobilize around $5 billion in investment for Iraq. Our main focus in working in a country like Iraq is to, uh, uh, is to focus on the non-oil sector, because uh, the oil sector, unfortunately, does not create jobs. So if we are looking for developmental impact, in our strategy, we're trying to focus on the non-oil uh, sector. Also, you know, I mentioned all our investment, most of them are with foreign investors. So in our strategy, we are trying to focus on the Iraqi local investor, and we focus more on south-to-south -south, uh, investment. Our area of focus for the investment is power, gas, agriculture, banking, transportation. So basically, you know, anything related to the reconstruction of Iraq including cement, steel, and uh, so on. Now talking about investing in Iraq, why would anybody come and invest in Iraq? The way we look at it that, you know, in Iraq there is opportunities, but there is challenges. Looking at opportunities, Iraq's current uh, GDP budget is around 130 billion. An increasing percentage of that uh, budget is going uh, for uh, investment, which offer uh, uh, big opportunities. It's a healthy economy. There is a stable inflation rate. There is an increase in the foreign direct investment coming to the country. The sub there is substantial upside potential for investors coming to Iraq now, as long as they manage risk properly. And government is keen also to support the private sector. Now, on the negative side, I still have one more minute. Uh, there is poor and legal regulatory frame framework, lack of transparency. Uh, Tesla already mentioned that there is a serious challenge in identifying uh, uh, local Iraqis with the proper background to work with companies like uh, IFC. Uh, the World Bank Group did an investment climate assessment in Iraq, which basically we do a, a, a big survey and we ask investors about the challenges that are they facing in Iraq. As Tesla already mentioned, you notice that electricity is the number one priority. In fact, the political instability, corruption come after that. Then access to finance, and then you will see that, like number 13 or 14 is the legal and regulatory uh, framework. So basically, I want to focus now on the challenges that we are facing in dealing with Iraqi investors. The first challenge is what we call an investor due diligence. If you want to partner with anybody, you need to know who is your partner. And this is a challenge in, uh, in Iraq. We need to make sure that we are not dealing with politically exposed people. We are not dealing with fronts and this is something that we face uh, uh, uh, all the time. We need to know the source of wealth, so we need to make sure that we are dealing with a leg legitimate private sector company, and we take our reputational risk uh, really serious, and this is why we give this 
uh, a priority. So investigating the investors that we want to deal with is a big uh, challenge. The second uh, uh, type of challenges we face is what I call lack of knowledge in international practice. I have an investor who called me. He said he wants to come and see me. He's in Zaho. I was in Erbil. He wants to drive three hours to see me. I send him a list of the things that we need. I say, basically, you know, if I want to look at the project, I need a concept note. I need a feasibility study, a, a financial model. The guy come to see me with a handwritten paper, two pages for a $20 million investment. And I think he expected to get a check by the end of that meeting. Doesn't work this way, unfortunately. So uh, uh, uh, having the basic knowledge of how to prepare a good feasibility study, um, uh, you know, I'm talking about audited account also. If we want to deal with somebody, we need to know exactly their uh, financial capabilities. And the only way to do it is to have audited account. Nobody audits their account in, uh, in Iraq. And in fact, it's, it's worse. It's the opposite. They give you audited account where they are losing money. And you will tell them, you know, how do you want me to invest with you? And they say, well, we have two set. This is for the taxes, but I have the real set of, uh, of account. Anyway, I'm out of time uh, here. Uh, I would like to thank you. I would like to say that IFC is here for business, and we are ready to contribute to the development and reconstruction of Iraq. Thank you. Ziad, you can depend on firms like me to bring you the good deals and then... Sure. Um, we have audited financials, so... You're there. Finally, I'd like to introduce Philip Khoury. Um, Rabia Securities, my firm, have been very, very successful in one thing, attracting foreign capital into the Iraqi stock exchange. Um, I used to be one of the fund managers who, you, who, who invested in weird countries, countries where nobody else can go. And, um, and uh, the, the hedge fund managers that actually invest in the Iraqi stock exchange are, are that caliber. They go to places like Iraq, Zimbabwe, Sri Lanka, Mongolia. Right? Uh, Philip um, was um, credited with uh, starting uh, the research um, uh, firm or research arm of EFG Hermes of Egypt that EFG became the most successful investment bank in the, in the region. Um, he quit EFG, I think, at the right time, just before Egypt uh, was going down the hill, and uh, started Impera Capital. He has a fund that invests in the Iraqi Stock Exchange. He also has a fund that invests in Mongolia. And he will give us a little bit why, from the perspective of, of, a, of, a, of a, what portfolio investor, um, investing in the Iraqi Stock Exchange could be very profitable. Philip? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to split my presentation to three parts. The first part, I'll just summarize what investors look for when they invest in a stock market in an emerging market. And the second is I'll go through why people might want to invest in Iraq uh, and what, uh, what attracts people to the ISX. And lastly, I'm going to go through what can be done to improve the attractiveness of the Iraqi capital markets. Okay, so first question is why have an equity market? Well, the purpose of an equity market is to provide a forum for companies to raise equity capital. If you don't have an equity market, it's difficult to raise large amounts of equity, right? You're limited to the debt markets. Why attract foreign institutions? Well, foreign institutions are the most demanding type of investor. If you can attract foreign institutions, you can attract any type of investor. So what do institutions look for? Well, in an ideal world, they look for a stable and improving political environment. They look for a stable and improving economic environment. They look for a sizable market. The larger the market, the more scope there is uh, for growth for the companies that are listed on that market. They look for a reliable framework for ownership and trading. 
there's no point having a fantastic opportunity and not knowing whether the shares belong to you or whether you'll get your money back. And lastly, uh, they look for quality companies. They want companies that will be able to exploit the growth opportunities in that country. So in, in the investment world, we have four general categories of markets. You have developed markets. These include Canada, US, Western Europe, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, and that's about it. You have emerging, and that goes anywhere from China, India, Brazil, right down to Egypt. You have frontier markets, which are a sort of a mini version of emerging markets, less liquid, less big, um, less efficient. And then you have markets that are considered to be off-index, i.e., you know, they're not really worthy of inclusion in the frontier index. And this includes Iraq, actually. So Iraq today is an ex-index country, but is fully capable of making it into the frontier category. So why invest in Iraq? Well, uh, what makes Iraq particularly interesting is that today it's producing, you know, its, its, its daily production is actually very low relative to its potential, relative to its reserves. So according to the IEA, I'm sorry, that problem, according to the IEA, Iraq could be producing anywhere between 4 million barrels a day and 9 million barrels a day by 2020. Let's say it's 6 million barrels a day. That's about twice what it's producing today. Now, for a low-cost oil producer to be able to double production, to be able to add 3 million barrels a day is, is incredible in today's world. No other country can do that, perhaps, uh, except Iran. So also what makes Iraq very interesting is that despite all the political problems that we've had in the last 10 years, Iraq has managed to increase oil output from 2 million barrels a day in 2006 to about 3.2 today. Um, and the reason for that is actually that the oil reserves are based in politically stable parts of the country, the deep south and the far north. Um, and this is what makes Iraq attractive to people despite the noise, you know, uh, the bad political noise that we hear, the violence and so on and so forth. So, it, uh, Ziad touched on this. Also, what makes Iraq very interesting is that growth uh, for the next five years is going to be anywhere between 6 and 10 percent real, according to the IMF. Uh, Iraq is forecast to run fiscal surpluses, current account surpluses for the next five years. Uh, debt is coming down relative to GDP, reserves are going up, inflation is low, interest rates are fairly low for an emerging market, and uh, the currency is more or less pegged to the dollar. So let's look at the Iraqi stock market. Um, the market has significantly outperformed frontier markets and seems insensitive to domestic security uncertainty. So if you look at the bottom right-hand chart, since the middle of 2002, despite the increase in violence, especially in the, in the last nine months of last year, the market has con continued going up. Now, liquidity in the market is quite tight. I mean, looking at one to two million dollars uh, a day, which is low. Uh, also, choice is effectively limited to Asia Cell, the banking sector, and one beverage distributor. That's your real choice in this market. It's a fairly limited market. So if you're going to invest in Iraq, you really have to invest in the banking sector. So I thought it would be useful to show you why one might want to invest in the banking sector. Iraq has the lowest level of, in absolute terms of private sector deposits in the region. So the absolute level of deposits belonging to the private sector is lower than countries like Oman, like Jordan, um, and much lower than other countries that have the same sort of hydrocarbon endowment as Iraq. So despite Iraq being one of the four largest countries in the region, and you can see, you can see that on the sort of red circles on the left-hand chart, um, and this is also reflected in the fact that credit to relative GDP is extremely low. It's below 10%. And again, it's the lowest in the entire region. Uh, this is also reflected in a very low level of branches for the country's size. So you've got approximately one branch for every 34,000 people. 
Compare that to Oman, which is one for every 6,000, Lebanon, one for every 4,000. So this leads to a situation which is illustrated on the right-hand side, where you have a man carrying a huge bag of cash. Okay? Now, I've never seen that anywhere else in the world. Okay? But this is a frequent sight in Iraq, where people carry literally potato sacks of cash. Uh, so obviously, in 10 years' time, this isn't going to exist anymore these sorts of transactions will happen through the banking system. Um, it's all well and good to have a small banking sector, but is it growing? And the answer is yes, it is. In 2007, deposits in the private banks were only $2 billion. In 2012, they hit $7.5 billion. So you're looking at an annual growth rate of 33%. This is very high. Another thing that's interesting about the Iraqi banking sector is that it's actually very low risk. You put the two words together, Iraq and banking, and low risk, it just doesn't, doesn't work. But it does. Why? Because actually banks don't lend a lot. They only lend around 30% of their deposits. And also the equity base relative to their loans is, I mean, normally in, a, in an emerging market, banks will lend five times their equity base, six times their equity base. In Iraq, they lend less than one times their equity base. So this is a very embryonic banking sector. Okay, uh, this leads us on to the last part, which is what can we do to improve the investing environment in Iraq? Well, politics, economics, and size, those are given to us. We can't do much about that. Um, uh, but infrastructure and attracting better companies to the market, we can. Okay? So, First thing is to focus on the plumbing, okay? the plumbing of the market. So custody. Global custody is a must for Iraq to graduate to frontier market status and to be taken seriously as a capital market. Um, today, if you own shares in Iraq, they're held by a subsidiary of the Iraqi Stock Exchange. Um, but what we mean by global custody is that those shares should really be held by Bank of New York, by City by anyone who you designate uh, should hold those shares so that a foreign investor feels secure in their ownership. Second thing, settlement. Um, today, if I want to buy shares in Iraq, I have to wire it to a broker. And from when the, sh the money is arrives at the broker to when it's spent on shares, we take broker risk. So if the broker goes under, if the broker is dishonest, we lose our money, right? Um, the way it should work is that we use the broker, but the money does not go through the broker, so we don't have to take broker risk. Liquidity. Um, if you're an investor in Bank of Baghdad uh, in July 2013, and you subscribe to the rights issue, you would not have been able to trade. So let's say you own $100 in Bank of Baghdad. For seven months, you would not have been able to trade 30% of your shares because they were effectively frozen. So it's only in February 2014 that we were able to trade our shares in Bank of Baghdad. That's what we mean by improving liquidity conditions. It doesn't happen in other countries. Why does it happen in Iraq, right? Um, listing rules. Today, if you're a company, you're a good company and you want to list on the market, um, it's difficult. Um, in countries like Iraq, the regulator prefers to have a greenfield project where they know that $100 million is coming to the project, that the, the stock is being valued at $100 million, and they list all well and good. But the problem with a greenfield project is it tends to be higher risk than, a, than an existing company, than a running concern. The problem with a running concern is that it's more difficult to value. So the regulator feels more comfortable with valuing a greenfield than valuing a going concern. Whereas for an investor, it's much better to invest in a going concern, even if the valuation is uncertain. Anyway, it's up to them to decide on the valuation, right? Um, so the listing rules have to change somewhat. And lastly, uh, governance, financial transparency. Um, it's important to have accounts audited by a known uh, auditor, it's preferably one of the big four. Insider dealings. Uh, insider dealings have to be regulated. So if 
large shareholders, board members, senior management trade in the shares, it has to be disclosed, and there have to be rules managing that process. Um, management of conflicts. Uh, companies that have a large number of minority shareholders that have weak rights should really have independent board members. So, you know, this should be instituted. So, thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, when I introduced Philip, I told you this bunch thinks differently, and uh, that's a proof. So they see, um, a lot of the fund managers see the opportunity where others see disaster, and, and, and they push the market that way. Um, I will open, um, I have a few questions from Twitter, but I will open also the, the, the, the, the questions, um, the, the floor for a question and answer. But let me just first go with this question. It says, the KRG investment law provides investors with 10 years tax-free. Is there fine print? Um, it's asked by, I think, a journalist from the investing group. I can answer this one very softly. Um, as an investor, I get very paranoid when a government tells me it's tax-free. Because how does a government make money without charging taxes? So whenever I hear tax-free, I, I would like to see what's hidden. Now, if you tell me there is a percentage of tax, I can put it in the financial projections of my, my deal. But tax-free is not always a very good idea. And I mentioned this to the government of Kurdistan, KRG, but of course, we'll see how things change. I have a question from the gentleman. Please make your question brief, no comments, otherwise I'll cut you off, because last time, uh, you next. I can. I will cut you off because because last last time I have to. We have to, and I would Thank like you, more sir. students in the back. Thank you, sir, very right. much. Thank you. Sure. Um, my question is addressed to Mr. Farouk. In, I'll speak in Arabic. I'll speak in Arabic. Anta ya Sayyidi, sami'tu an kal kathir, fa'arifu anna ka alamun min alam al iktisad al Sulaimani, bal wal Kurdistani wa rabbam al Iraqi aydan. سمعت الكثير عن خلقك واهتمامك بالشباب وبالرعية وبالناس فسؤالي هو أنت استثمرت اقتصاديا في هذا البلد ألا تظن أن الاستثمار في الموارد البشرية له نفس الأهمية ونحن نجلس بين ظهراني جامعة تخرج العديد من الطلبة الذين هم عماد المستقبل هل فكرتم بمشاريع؟ صغيرة تنمي هذه القابليات شكرا لكم سيدي شكرا شكرا الحقيقة الاهتمام بالموارد البشرية اهتمام يجب أن الجميع يهتمون بالموارد البشرية العراق يملك الموارد البشرية بشكل كبير أو هائل موزع بين الداخل والأكثرية في الخارج بالنسبة الجامعة كمثل أو كمثال جامعة الأمريكية أنا شخصيا ولدى زملاء آخرين جالسين هنا نتعاون وتعاوننا مع الجامعة الأمريكية باعتبارها جهة مهمة لنشوء جيل جديد سواء من تعلم وتعلم اللغة أو العلوم المختلفة الموارد البشرية تنشأ وتطور بالتأكيد وله الأهمية الكبيرة من الممكن القيام بأعمال مالية فاينانسين لأي مشروع من الممكن الشراء من الممكن وكل شيء وكوكا كمبيوتر كأحدث شيء إذا البشر هو اللي يصنعه وهو اللي يطوره بالتأكيد إلى أهمية كبيرة وهل جامعة أنشئت كجزء من من إيجاد وتربية الجيل آخر للموارد البشرية ونحن في شركاتنا بالتأكيد نرى أهمية الموارد البشرية الموارد البشرية هنا بالنسبة لنا أنا تكلمت عن 
خطوات في بناء مشاريعنا استنجدنا بموارد بشرية أجنبية ذات خبرة عالية وأنشأنا بجانبها مراكز تدريب وممارسة للكادر الوطني لخلق لخلق كادر جديد ونحن أتصور كعراق ككل أيضا توجد هذا التطور وهذا شيء مهم بالتأكيد كاك فاروق how many إيش إيش كم عامل عندك حاليا يشتغل لشركات فاروق جروب شركات اللي أنا مساهم بها أو أملكها أو مساهم بها مباشرة وغير مباشرة في حدود ثلاثين ألف شخص هذا اللي دا قصته بال private investment سؤال هنا أنا الرحمن غريب مدير مركز ميترو للدفاع عن حقوق الصحفيين في الإقليم سؤالي هو الأستاذ كاك فاروق كاك فاروق أنتم تستثمرون في العديد من القطاعات ولكن لم نرى استثماراتكم في القطاع الإعلامي على الرغم من متابعتنا نحن كصحفيين وكمركز لدعمكم للإعلام الحر وأتمنى الزملاء المشاركون أيضا يعطون رأيهم حول قضية الاستثمار في المجال الإعلامي في العراق ما هو رأيكم؟ شكرا جزيلا تجابي دمو المساهمة في الإعلام بالتأكيد مساهمة لها لها دور كبير في تقدم المجتمع ككل خاصة الإعلام الإعلام الإعلام المحترم وبالتأكيد جنابك تشتغل في مجالات إعلامية محترمة نحن كشركة شركات وبالذات آسيا سير نتعامل مع الصحافة وجميع مجالات الإعلام بالمساهمة والمساعدة وفي كل العراق جميع الفضائيات جميع المحطات الراديو وجميع الجرائد المحترمة مرة أخرى أقول فيها إعلانات أكثر من حاجتنا لنشر الإعلانات وإنما كمساعدة للصحافة الحرة Uh, and uh, talking uh, about media, media is never a good investment. <laughs> so, so <laughs> talking coldly, it's not a good thing to invest in. Uh, I don't know if he's a student or... Please introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, Aman Jarwesi from uh, Dubai Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, we recently opened our office in uh, January in Erbil as a representation office and uh, on a weekly basis we get contacted by Emirati companies uh, that want to invest here. There's already a significant amount of Emirati investment even though the number of companies are small. One of the main issues that I deal with on a daily basis is uh, market data, the transparency of information in Iraq, in the Kurdistan region, uh, population figures, uh, trade numbers, um, uh, numbers of companies that are registered in the region and different sectors. Um, I'm very interested to, especially to Mr. Philip Khouri from, um, uh, from your investment uh, consultancy, how do, you, um, how do you gain access to this information? I saw that you had some sources there, the IMF, the World Bank, um, but I also deal with some certain sources and sometimes figures are not uh, consistent. You can get one figure from one ministry, you can get a different figure from another uh, ministry. So uh, in, your, in your daily uh, operations and in your um, advisory, um, and actually I want to, uh, this uh, question to... Actually, Mr. that's, well. that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, we publish reports also. We, there is no real statistics office that has kept uh, of statistics, but I'll ask Philip, how do you get numbers? Actually, the, the regulator is very good. Um, they have a single website where um, uh, all the financial statements of all the listed companies are actually available. Uh, it's in Arabic, of course. Um, it'd be great if it'd be in Arabic and English, um, so it'd be a more level playing field, but at least they exist, right? Um, so this is for company-specific information. So actually, the regulator is doing that right, okay? Um, 
for, I mean, banking sector data is always the most reliable in any emerging market, right? Um, because uh, central bank has access to it. So uh, any financial, you know, any banking sector related or balance of payments uh, type data is available through the central bank website. Although I have to admit, it is published very late. So, um, for example, 2012 information only became available in the final quarter of 2013. So the lag should really be two months. It shouldn't be nine months, but it's, it's there. I, I will come up front. We have some time, but are there any students in the back who want to ask questions? Okay, the lady, I, yes, or the two ladies. Uh, hello. My question is that uh, uh, Iraq is in a very open market, and uh, we import a lot of products. So my question is basically, why don't we put finished products in our, our own country instead of importing so many products? So what do you mean? Why don't we produce in our own country? Yes. Especially oil. We can... The, so many products the, the, the problem is not importing products. I think a consumer, those of us who believe in open markets, a consumer should have access to the cheapest product available at the quality available. The problem is we have no control over the borders for the quality of products entering the market. Today, the chicken available in Baghdad, we do none of that because we're doing a study on it, a lot of it is contaminated, expired arrives from Brazil, Ukraine, Turkey, Iran. No one to stop it. It's not the price. It's the quality that, that has to be checked. But as a consumer, you should be able to buy the most competitive product on the market. Thank you. One more student. That's a student. That guy. My name is Sakar Shadala. I have a question for Mr. Farouk. When he said that ICSL was created by him and some of his friends and some people who helped him to establish ICSL, were there political parties in it by establishing ICSL or did he create it by himself and his friends? And is it nowadays also available or is it nowadays can someone, is someone able to produce or establish another phone sector as well. Thank you. Does it make a button? Loyal uh, Khatib, my my question to uh, uh, Ziad uh, Bader. We saw from the uh, chart of risks that uh, power generation, um, availability of electricity um, poses significant uh, challenge to investors, and this possibly explains one of the challenges that Isra mentioned in terms of like uh, the power supply. Maybe I would add to that is the availability of competitive uh, feedstock um, to, to sustain any investment locally. Um, my question is, um, it's nothing to do with the actual financial or things, it's to do with the population. Iraq's population uh, growth is growing about 3.1% uh, uh, per annum. By um, 2030, Iraq's population will reach around uh, 55 million from the 33 million now. Uh, surely Iraq cannot kill uh, um, the unemployment by its current tactics, which is building up on unemployment, um, mask unemployment in the public sector. Otherwise, we will be bankrupt by 2020. Do you think that um, the current bureaucracies and, and, uh, and policies will eventually create some sort of um, um, um, public unrest because of uh, increasing unemployment beyond 2020 
that could eventually threaten uh, businesses, especially in the private sector? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, when, when we started the session, we were talking about the role of the private sector to create the jobs. Um, unfortunately, the mentality in Iraq uh, uh, is a mentality of dependence on the public sector. Even the private businessmen try to survive on tenders from the public sector. I think a change of mentality is really needed. If you want really to create jobs to absorb the high level of unemployment in Iraq, you need to let the private sector operate and you need to support the private sector. And I'll take this question also to answer the other question about availability of data because this is also important. Uh, it is a serious challenge. If I want to invest in hotel or in cement, I want to do a market study. Where do you get the data? Unfortunately, so far, uh, we have to do it the hard way. We have to collect our own data. So the existence of uh, uh, centers like, you know, where we are right now, the American University, where you could have researcher work on specific areas and uh, try to have this type of data available for investors in, in, in different uh, type of sectors that will help attract uh, investors. Uh, knowledge is power. If you don't have it, you know, investors will not be able to come. I'll have to take two more questions. The gentleman here has been raising his hand for a long time, and he looks like a new face. Uh, thanks. My, my name is Kawabe Sarani. Um, obviously, uh, Kurdistan and Iraq, in general speaking, have gone through uh, central command economy to the uh, market economy. Uh, and there's an uh, important role and, you know, to play uh, for, the, for the private sector, obviously. But what we have seen the last 10 years, it's uh, actually an open market in the way that there's no infrastructure in you know, investment at all in this country and our market became an open market to the worst cheapest quality of products we, we discussed that in yes, the, in the, yeah. yes my my point is that i believe that the the still there's important role for the the government to play in building the infrastructure that's the first question second the question is uh, addressing to Musa Ziad and philip group while you do investment in this area, would you like, uh, look at toward corruption, democracy, human rights, investment, or that's the issues is really not concerning to you what's going on in the area? Thank you. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, when we look at, our, uh, our, uh, at any investment, okay, we really take into consideration everything related to uh, uh, respecting not only uh, international law but also local law. So when we are looking at uh, investing with an Iraqi in, uh, uh, investor, we, we have to take into consideration all of this. We look if there is violation when it comes to child labor. We look at, as, as I mentioned, if uh, you're talking about corruption, this is why we need to check about the source of wealth of the investor we are dealing, uh, uh, we are dealing with. So we really do our due diligence before we get uh, involved. And this is a challenge. This is why we're not able to dump billions of dollars in investment in Iraq. Because every investment takes us on average between a year to a year and a half to uh, do the appraisal, to do it the right way before we are able to uh, really disperse the funds. I'm sorry, I, you know, every, although we plead democracy, once we get down a bit, it's all dictatorships. The dictator of this place told me to stop. Yes. <laughs> so Kag Barham just ordered us to stop. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, okay, so you're asking, where, okay, there is a beautiful lady over there. I, I, have, I, have to give the, I have to give the floor to the beautiful lady. She's been like standing up along. Okay. She, huh? Yes, okay. Thanks for this compliment. Uh, my name is Hajan Kamanshali. I'm representing Identity Center from Jordan, working in social and politic development. I have two questions, one for Kag Farouk and one for the panel. My question for Kag Farouk is, how did you manage to do all these great 
project without having a banking system in the region. And my question to the panel is, why do you think KRG is not developing banking system or banking sector as it does for oil and gas sector? Thank you. For the, for the first question, I will let Kafaro answer himself. How can you do it without a banking system? Uh, for the second question, I have the same one, and they don't answer me. شيء مهم في تكوين شخصيته وفي ممارسته للأعمال وفي كل الأعمال سواء الأعمال الصناعية خدمات والأعمال السياسية أيضا إرادة الإنسان القوي المؤمن بشعبه بالذات والمؤمن بالمستقبل كثير من الناس يتكلمون على أن أن وشركاتنا جميع أعمالنا داخل البلد ولا نملك شيء في الخارج فمهتمون ببناء البلد بالنسبة للنظام المصرفي النظام المصرفي توجد مصارف بالعراق والنظام المصرفي الحكومي ضعيف نوعا ما في كردستان لي قطع العلاقة علاقة بنوك الحكومية الرافدين والرشيد سابقا بالحكومة المركزية وهذا كان خطأ كلش كبير من حكومة الأقليم ودائما أنا دعيت إلى إعادة العلاقات لأن هالبنوك أتى أنظمة جيدة وعتم أموال كثيرة وكبيرة من الممكن كان ولا يزال من الممكن الاهتمام بهذا الجانب وإعادة العلاقات بين مصارف بغداد ومصارف كردستان على العموم المصرف العراقي للتجارة حاليا يلعب دور يلعب دور كبير ويوجد بعض بعض المصارف الأهلية يلعبون دور دور ليس كبير أكثر الأكثر المصارف الموجودة في العراق هي كصرافين صرا صرافين لتحويل المال من من بالداخل وبالخارج ويربحون فقط من عمل من هذه العملية اللي الحقيقة هي مو عملية صيرفية أو عملية مصرفية على طريق الصحيح. Can I ask you a question? As for the KRG, as I said, I, I don't know the answer because they're not answering me. Victor Barham, I don't know. Um, I, think, I think we're going to stop here. You, you're more than welcome to talk to the panelists. Uh, we have another exciting panel after this. It's about Turkey, and I have a personal issue there. So you listen to me tentatively. Now you have to listen to my wife. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated and remain in the conference as we will start the next panel immediately. We will not have a break between these two panels. Please remain seated and remain in the conference hall for the next panel. Thank you.
Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Is it okay? One, two, three. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, may we have your attention, please? Ladies and gentlemen, the next panel is ready to start. If you take your seats. Right. I'm on? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're about to start. Ladies and gentlemen, I regret that 
Karim Rajapur of the Khanak Endowment cannot be with us today, so I'm standing in for him. Uh, I'm Thanasi Mulakis. I've had the privilege of being president of this great seat of learning, and it is with great joy that I am back, especially since I'm only responsible for the things that go well, not for anything <laughs> that does not. <laughs> um, let me also say that if, if, if proof were necessary that the Kurdistan region, that Suleymaniyah, that this institution is open to uh, and offers itself as a platform of mutual understanding of people with a variety of uh, a sense of belonging, as the Turkish foreign minister said, said before, uh, opening uh, uh, the uh, possibilities of tolerant dialogue, then you must admit that putting a Greek in charge of a, committee, of a, of a, of a panel about Turkey is the very sign of such mutual understanding. <laughs> Uh, the panel will discuss different aspects of uh, Turk and Turkish developments of developments in Turkey, internal and external. Uh, first, Ipek Cem, Ipek Cem Taha, who is director of the Colombo Global Centers in Turkey, who will uh, speak about the relations of Turkey and EU. Uh, then, uh, Nure Mert, uh, who is uh, a, column, a columnist for the uh, very well-known Hürriyet uh, newspaper and has also been active in television who will speak about Turkey and its position and its relations with the region. Uh, uh, Bejan Matur, uh, a Turkish author, a poet, uh, a winner of many prizes, uh, whom we're delighted to have with us again, and a part of the DPI Council of Experts, will speak about the process of the peace process, who, among other things, has, has relations with the Yarbak here, if nothing else. So she will speak with great expertise about the uh, uh, process of, of, of reaching peace uh, between the Turkish mainstream, if it's still that, <laughs> and, and, and the Kurds. And finally, but not least, uh, my dear friend Henri Barke, uh, Professor of International Relations at Lehigh University and a trustee of the American University of Iraq in Sulaymaniyah. Mr. Jem, <laughs> Ipek. Thank you. I do hope that you have the appetite to hear. Ten minutes, by the way, for each one, okay. strictly, because we're already running an hour late. And please, again, I will remind you when we take questions that we have, we're going to make sure that they are truly questions and not hidden speeches, and there will be few of them and brief. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. It's, I, ho I do hope that you have the patience to hear another Taha. I want to say that it's really an honor and a privilege to be at the event at the American University of Iraq uh, in Suleimani. I do hope there will be many to come. It almost seems counterintuitive, after all the discussions we've been having, to commence a discussion about Turkey with the subject of the European Union. You might be wondering, is the European Union-Turkey relationship a priority? In a way, you would be right. Because when you take the perspective from both the EU and the Turkish side, and given some of the regional and global developments, let's look at some of the recent developments. Uh, in terms of the EU, the Ukraine issue and Russia and the enlargement policy uh, is giving new challenges to the European Union. There is a reluctance, and our European friends, I know, get very upset when I say this, but there is definitely a reluctance on the part of the European Union to finalize Turkey's full membership. Too populist, perhaps, and too culturally different. Muslim undertone there. Uh, the Muslim and the Turkish communities in the EU giving many countries in the EU some you know, cause for pausing demonstrated by the acceptance of many Balkan states in short accession periods, such as Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia, becoming full members in the past decade. In addition, the European Union as a bloc, it has been pushed, put to the test, the economic crisis, high un unemployment, um, strong countries in the EU versus a European Union coordinated policy effort. When we look at the Turkish side, uh, things are also not going so well vis-a-vis -vis the EU. The European Union is a low priority now in the agenda of both the government and in the hearts and minds of the Turkish people. Further emphasis on the diversification of Turkish external relations, including external commercial relations with the rest of the world, undermine 
the, the EU's role in the Turkish psyche, let's say. And there are, of course, regional and global developments, many of which will be mentioned. But just to mention the grave instability in the Middle East and Africa, the citizenship recognition and requests from Brazil to Venezuela to Egypt to Turkey, and the re-emergence of Iran as a regional actor are changing uh, the landscape for the Turkish-European relationship. Given this backdrop, I like to uh, liken the current status of Turkish and EU relations to a reluctant couple on the way to a marriage, but neither party is fully too committed to that marriage, to the actual act of marriage. It does, on the other hand, serve the agenda of both Turkey and the European Union to have the possibility of that marriage, or at least have the ideology associated with such a marriage. As you know, the road to the possibility of Turkey becoming a full member of the European Union has been long and winding, as opposed to many of the countries which are now full members of the European Union, our relationship started about 65 years ago with Turkey making the plea to become a full member of the European Economic Community. The governments of Turkey generally viewed the European project as an extension of their modernization pro projects. Some of the milestones have been in 1995 we declared the customs union. In 1999, Turkey was declared a candidate state of the European Union without any precondition at the Helsinki summit. So in the late 1990s, what was occurring in the uh, external relations agenda of Turkey was quite different. Uh, while having been uh, adversaries uh, and enemies really, for many decades and hundreds of years, Turkey and Greece started a rapprochement. And this rapprochement helped the European Union um, uh, candidacy of Turkey. Nowadays, though, the scales have completely shifted. Uh, Greece is uh, in dire straits, while Turkey in the past decade has caught on to some really sustainable and strong economic development and international standing. The fate of the EU itself is still a discussion in light of the recent economic recession, as well as the existence of deep divides in policy matters. I'd like to also point to Thank you. the foreign policy evolution of Turkey. Turkish approaches to foreign policy have also changed in the past decade, and we had uh, Foreign Minister Davutoğlu address the same crowd yesterday. The Turkish rapprochement with the Middle East and with Muslim dominant nations, while commencing in, in the 1990s, has really found voice within the general ideology of the AKP in the first decade of the 21st century. During the early years of the AKP government, it was really important for the AKP to, sh to both show to the reluctant uh, parts of Turkish society uh, that the, they were going to go on with the European Union project. Because at the time, this was really viewed as the next stage in the evolution of Turkey. Um, they also uh, made very clear to our international allies that this was important for them. Currently, uh, going back to today, and I know that my um, fellow panelists will talk a lot about this, Turkey is going through uh, a very difficult period, and we don't know what to expect. Um, basically, the reality of experiencing, democ experiencing democracy in Turkey versus how it sounded to the EU based on the number of chapters negotiated or the image of democracy in Turkey is quite different when you experience it as a Turkish citizen. Whether you're a minority or a woman or a journalist in prison or a young environmental activist, one does not feel that we live in a truly democratic society just because we have electoral processes. I feel that Turkey today is not only going through a corruption scandal, but uh, to be accurate, a series of corruption scandals, but we are also experiencing a sense of moral bankruptcy. In addition, the institutions and the citizens of our society who can shed light on the matter 
such as the media or the judiciary, are unlawfully being dominated by the executive part of the Turkish government. Unfortunately, the image of Turkish, Turkey as a democracy uh, has been subsiding ever since the Gezi protests broke out in Taksim Square. Other realities, such as the hundreds of journalists and others unlawfully jailed, were there, but not as visible, perhaps. This was the breaking point. With reference to the EU, this corruption scandal uh, really touches on matters related to the EU as well as one of the ministers who had to resign due to the first uh, wave of corruption allegations is Egemen Bağış, who is the Minister for European Affairs. And it didn't stop at that. The European Union in the past couple of days has started its own corruption probe into the Turkish Ministry of European Affairs on a different matter relating to funds for the youth programs. So what to expect from Turkey and what to expect from Europe in the coming days? Um, as you know, we have uh, elections coming up in Turkey this year and possibly next year. On March 30th, we'll be having the municipal elections. And in August 20, 2014, we might be having the presidential elections. And there is a chance that the presidential elections and the general elections in Turkey might be combined um, at a date such as December 2014. So these elections will really show how the different constituencies, I didn't get into all the constituencies in Turkey, there's a lot to talk about, uh, will be uh, putting their strategic positions vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the future of Turkey, vis-a-vis -vis the what, what progresses in Turkey and how that relates to EU. So going back to the beginning of my address, are the engaged parties ready for marriage, ready to take on the commitment of Turkey as a full member of the EU? While there's no definite answers, there are now several signs of movement, including a willingness on the part of Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot leaders to commence talks as well as the opening of new chapters in negotiations which began four years ago. In politics and international relations, there are no definite answers, but only alternative scenarios. So keep watching the new developments in the old couple called European Union and Turkey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead. What am I supposed to talk about? <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> no, I'm uh, first I need to present myself. It's not that I'm complaining about your presentation of me, but it's my fault that I didn't send my CV. And it's not that I'm, you know, complaining about being presented as a journalist, but it's my, it's not my occasion. I, I, I was a columnist, and I still write a column in Hurriyet Daily but my pr primary vocation is academia's life, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't want to be uh, seen that I attribute uh, importance to academic titles and look down on journalism, on the contrary, but uh, I'm an associated professor of political science and teaching in Istanbul University to, to be able to give a better picture. And as I especially need to emphasize the fact that I'm not writing uh, a column or you know doing anything on TV anymore in Turkey because uh, it, it is something which says a lot about Turkey or which may say a lot about Turkey's present circumstances uh, that I'm fired from my old jobs in TV and in, in journalism and as a columnist because of political pressures because that I was critical of the present government on many respects. And again, I don't want to be seen as someone who is constantly suffering from persecution complex. <laughs> but after all, we are talking about uh, politics in Turkey and its you know, possible uh, role uh, uh, in, in navigating challenges in the Middle East, as the title of the conference suggests. Uh, and after, after that, um, I'm not going to be a good speaker uh, in the sense that I will keep up with my criticism uh, of Turkish pol foreign policy. 
it may not be a proper place to do so. But since our prime, uh, foreign minister made a surprising visit to, to our conference, to Suleimani, uh, despite that I'm the critic, a critic of the government and uh, have been very critical of Turkish foreign policy from the beginning. Uh, it does not mean that I'm not, you know, supporting uh, the improvement of relations between Turkey and the rest of the Middle East. And I'm a key and staunch supporter of improving relations between Turkey and KRG in particular. Uh, and I, I, I'm, after all, I'm happy that uh, Turkish foreign minister uh, came to Suleimani and uh, gave a speech uh, starting with Kurdish. It, I think it's, it has a, a big uh, symbolic value and I'm happy with all that. But I have some concerns that I want to express that. Uh, it, it was, I, it, uh, apparently it's a very critical time for the relations between QRG and the central government in, in Baghdad. And uh, indeed, in the uh, first session, the Prime Minister, uh, Nechirvan Barzani, expressed his uh, disagreements uh, uh, with, with the central government. And then Mr. Hoshar Zabari warned us about the shattering possible shattering of uh, trust between central government or consensus, Iraqi consensus, in his own words. And um, under those circumstances, uh, the visit of Turkey's foreign minister, uh, I think, I mean, can be perceived or overshadowed by by being seen as, either being seen as, you know, Turkey is just preoccupied with uh, its energy deals with KRG more than anything else, or siding with KRG against the central government in Baghdad. I hope, I mean, uh, Turkey could play a more positive role in mediating between KRG and the central government in Iraq and play a positive role in general in the Middle East. But unfortunately, Turkey lost this opportunity. Uh, and um, because, I mean, Turkey has a very bad remark. Starting with Iraq, actually, Turkey could not cope uh, to have balanced relation with the central government uh, in Iraq and uh, deteriorated its relations to the point of lack of communication even, to the point of a minister is accusing President, uh, Prime Minister Maliki as behaving like a tribal leader. And it was a crisis situation that we couldn't still resolve with the central government of Iraq. Uh, and um, under such circumstances, it is very unfortunate that Turkey cannot be a good ally even to KRG, unfortunately. I wish Turkey could be a better ally, partner, mediator uh, in Iraq and elsewhere. But unfortunately, Turkey lost this role by its regional politics in general, not only concerning politi policies uh, in Iraq or its relations. Uh, with, with uh, Iraq, uh, either you know, concerning central government or KRG in particular. But Turkey lost its credit by playing um, active role, especially in Syria. Uh, Turkey got very much into the conflict in Syria, taking sides, supporting armed groups, and uh, lost its credibility in terms of being an, you know, a, a, a sober actor, political actor, if you like. Uh, and then, especially also in Syria, starting with Syria, Turkey started to sound uh, 
as if he is pursuing sectarian interests and goals and you know taking and uh, Turkish foreign as if Turkish foreign policy is being increasingly shaped by sectarian uh, interests uh, because after all uh, starting with Syrian involvement in Syrian politics uh, prime ministers and uh, politicians government uh, politicians started to use this uh, sectarian language also in terms of you know challenging the opposition party politicians by underlining their sectarian affiliations and origins and then then came Egypt and Turkey lost even more credibility in terms of pursuing sober you know uh, actorship or role in the Middle Eastern politics in regional politics that's why I, I, I, I feel pity for that. I mean, I'm not very glad that, you know, my prophecy is fulfilled, that I was critical and I was right. I was justified by what happened to Turkish foreign policy at the end of the day. But as, as someone who is living in Turkey and very concerned about, observer of politics and very concerned about Turkey's regional politics, domestic politics and international politics, I feel really sorry and pity uh, for being ended up so badly. After all, it's not only our government, it is, it, it, it, we all live in this country and we are very concerned about that. And finally, I know that I have no more time so other than one minute. In this one minute, I will uh, also uh, underline the fact that unless you have uh, a good command of navigating, actually, <laughs> challenges of your domestic you know, politics. Uh, you can't play a positive role internationally, regionally. And nowadays, Turkey is suffering from major political crisis that I refuse to call uh, as uh, corruption case because it's beyond corruption case. And I don't think that, actually, in the eyes of the prime minister and the government, it's not a corruption. And, uh, uh, and I also think that it's not a simple matter of corruption. It is a matter of, you know, a political crisis, you know, uh, beyond, you know, being simple, you know, corruption case. In the eyes of the government, it's a financing of, of politics in different ways. Uh, and this uh, financing of politics, okay, uh, is shaped by the uh, by by the government's um, ambition, if you like, of leading the Muslim world uh, uh, and uh, being being a global actor and all that. That's why I mean it's more than you know being a corruption case. I mean all this money thing is is about about financing this big mission. That's why I mean our prime minister is quite. Uh, confident about uh, denouncing all kinds of accusations and I buy this argument of him because you know it's it's more than corruption and it's not a simple case of you know we having corrupt politicians and all that thank you so much I don't have any more time if you have some more questions I can elaborate on that well thank you professor Mertz and uh, with my apologies along with my Sorry, thanks no, it's my for fault. being misinformed <laughs> well, insufficiently informed. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I apologize. I'm going to speak in Turkish because I can express myself better in Turkish. Uh, actually, I'm a Kurdish, uh, Kurd from Turkey. But, Kurman Jemini Kema Affe. Şimdi benden son işte gelişmeler bu e, hükümet, AK Parti ve e, Gülen Hareketi arasındaki çatışma son döneme yansıyan ve bunun Kürt meselesine yansımasıyla ilgili konuşma yapmamı e, istediler. E, ben, evet bir kavga var. Artık görünür bir kavga bu. Tercüme yapılıyor değil mi? <gülüyor> görünür bir kavga. 17 Aralık'tan sonra artık herkes daha net koordinatlarını görebiliyor. 
e, bu görünen hani işte corruption e, gibi tarif edilen e, bir durum ama bunun gerisinde Nuray'ın da söylediği gibi daha büyük bir siyasi kavganın e, aslında bir güç paylaşımının e, kavgası olduğunu düşünüyorum ben. E, AK Parti ile Gülen Hareketi, ar- Hareketi arasında yaşanan kavganın. E, tabii bunu anlamak için biraz geriye gitmek lazım. İlk işaretleri ne zaman oluştu? E, Aralık ayında değil tabii. Çok daha öncesi var. E, AK Parti Gülen Hareketi Koalisyonu 10 senedir gayet güzel geçiniyorlardı. Ve iktidarı, gücü çok güzel paylaşıyorlardı. E, ve fakat e, 2011 yılında e, MİT Müsteşarı Hakan Fidan'ın bir savcı tarafından ifadeye çağrılması, müzakereleri yürüttüğü sebebiyle, PKK ile müzakereleri yürütme sebebiyle e, bunun ilk işareti oldu ve e, bize yansıyan tarafı e, hükümetin başındaki işte Tayyip Erdoğan'ın ve kurmaylarının giderek e, Gülen Hareketi'ne mesafe kazandığı, bürokrasi içindeki atamaları e, azalttığı, ya da tamamen dışladığı ee, diğer alanlarda da gücü giderek e, kendi yanına çekme e, avantajları kendi e, kullanma e, kararı e, bütün bunlar aralarındaki makası bir biçimde açıyordu ve zamanla dershane meselesi Gülen Hareketi işte dershaneler ve eğitim konusunda iddiası olan bir hareket e, dershaneleri kapatma kriziyle birlikte e, şeye dönüştü. E, giderek başbakanın e, söylemlerinden bizim anladığımız e, çatışma derinleşti ve e, onların mevcut olan koalisyondan da bildikleri e, zaten paylaşıyorlardı. Bütün süreci işte korupsiyon varsa bunun tanığıydılar. 10 sene boyunca bu korupsiyon hiç sorun olmadı. Ama 17 Aralık'ta bunun bir sorun olarak hükümetin önüne bir engel olarak çıkarılmasına cemaat karar verdi ve e, böylece halk da duymuş oldu. Türkiye kamuoyu ve dünya kamuoyu da duymuş oldu. Şimdi mesele aslında e, hani MİT kriziyle başlaması Kürt sorunuyla e, başlaması anlamına da gelebilir. Bana kalırsa Kürt sorunu AK Parti'nin ve yani hükümeti yürüten partinin ve e, Gülen Hareketi'nin Kürt meselesine bakış açısında aslında çok büyük fark yok. İkisi de milliyetçi refleksle, Türkçü refleksle, ne Osmanlı diyebileceğimiz bir refleksle meseleye yaklaşıyorlar. Yani bin yıl süren Türk <gülüyor> egemenliğinin daha da devam etmesi e, ve mümkün olduğu ölçüde bundan taviz verilmemesi kararıyla aslında meseleye yaklaşıyorlar. Ayrıştıkları yer şurası. AK Parti daha pragmatik davranarak Kürtlerin gücünü yanına alırsa Orta Doğu'da buradan bir sörf yapabileceğini, daha iddialı durabileceğini düşünüyor. Zaten bu karar çok daha öncesinde aslında devletin de ikna olduğu bir durum. Şöyle ki özel döneminde de bu niyet vardı. Orta Doğu'ya Kürtleri de yanına alarak Türklerin açılması. Ee, Emre Taner'in MİT Müsteşarlığı döneminde de e, yine benzer bir plan aslında derinden derine işliyordu. Ve Erdoğan buna ikna oldu. Yani bundan e, şey almasının e, bu e, Barış sürecini başlatmasının ona bir güç kazandıracağına ikna olduğu için devam etme kararı aldı. Fakat Erdoğan'ın barış süreci ya da açılım diye tarif ettiği dönemi e, yansımaları Gülen Hareketi'ni özellikle Güneydoğu'da rahatsız etti. Çünkü orada bir rekabet durumu yaşanıyor. Yani bir güç olarak kendini konumlandırma biçimi Güneydoğu'da Gülen Hareketi'nin PKK'nin alternatifi gibi. Yani seküler, sosyalist kökenli bir Kürtlük politik organizasyonunun karşısında e, biraz Türkçü refleksle 
biraz asimilasyoncu bir bakış açısıyla bölgede Kürtlüğü, hani Kürtlüğü sadece Kürt meselesini kültürel soruna indirgeyen ve e, işte ana dil hakkı verilirse, bir iki televizyon kanalı açılırsa, e, işte vatandaşlık, eşit vatandaşlık meselesi biraz olsun hallolursa, Kürt vatandaşlarımız mutlu olurlar ve biz saadet içinde devam ederiz mantığıyla aslında yaklaşıyorlardı. En temelde bu çok devletçi bir refleks aslında. Ee, Gülen'in BBC'de verdiği devletin izzeti nefsi kavramı çok önemli bir kavram. Ee, Kürt meselesine bakış açısında o devletçi refleksi e, devletin onurunu öne koyan bir yaklaşımı var Fethullah Gülen'in. E, ayrıştıkları yer orasıydı ve kavga görünmeye başladı. Tabi bu kavga neyi getiriyor? Türkiye kamuoyu şu anda e, sadece buna kilitlenmiş durumda. Hepimiz sadece bunu dinliyoruz, tapeleri okuyoruz, ses kayıtlarını dinliyoruz ve e, tamamen buna kilitlenmiş bir durumdayız. Ve e, tabi bu ne yapıyor? Hani barış süreci diye ya da açılım diye adı konulan meselenin daha da yavaşlamasına sebep oluyor. Demokratikleşmenin gecikmesine sebep oluyor. Avrupa Birliği neredeyse rafa kaldırılmış durumda. Kimsenin gündemini e, oluşturmuyor. E, bütün bunlar kamuoyu açısından, Türkiye toplumu açısından dezavantaj. Ama ben burada gerek hükümetin, gerekse Gülen Hareketi'nin aslında... E, zaman kazandığını ve bundan çok da gocunmadıklarını düşünüyorum. Bunu çok da e, negatif bulmadıklarını düşünüyorum. Çünkü nihayetinde Türkiye'nin demokratikleşmesi periferide kalan, kenarda kalan, e, sistemin içine eşit olarak dahil olamayan Kürtlerin, Alevilerin, azınlıkların, solun devamla dışarıda kalmasına sebep oluyor. E, bu kavganın devam etmesinde onlar açısından aslında bir dezavantaj yok. Kürtlere gelince Kürtler meseleye nasıl bakıyorlar? Ben Kürtlerin bu kavgada taraf olduğunu düşünmüyorum. Taraf olmayı da düşünmüyorlar. Taraf olmayı istemiyorlar. Hatta biraz böyle tırnak içinde kullanayım. Keyifle bu kavgayı izlediklerini de düşünüyorum. Çünkü... E bu kavganın sonucunda bir tür şeffaflaşma oluşacağını düşünüyorlar ki öyledir. Devlet daha da şeffaflaşabilir. Ee, ve de iki tarafın da o alanda e, güç iddiasında bulunan iki tarafın da e, şey olacağını, e, güç kaybedeceğini düşündükleri için taraf olmayı istemiyorlar. Çünkü Kürtlerin asıl meselesi aslında barış. Barış süreci. Yani barışın inşasının ve devamlılığının sağlanması ve sonuç alınması. Barıştan e, ne anlıyor Kürtler? Aslında adını tam olarak daha baştan söylemek gerekiyor. Kürt meselesi bir kültürel mesele değildir. Türkiye'de başından itibaren Aydınlar Devleti de yanıltan bir tutum içinde oldular ve hep bir kültürel mesele olarak sundular. Kürt meselesi aslında bir statü talebiyle başlayan bulunduğu alana hükmetme arzusunun sonucunda aslında antolojik bir mesele. Yani bu hani buradaki bölgesel yönetimde kısmen tatmin edilmiş durumda ama Kuzey Kürtleri bu ihtiyacı hala hissediyorlar ve bu ihtiyaç devam ediyor. Hükümetin Barış olarak, barış süreci ya da açılım politikasıyla arka planda devam ettirdiği bir strateji var mı Kürt meselesinin çözümüne dair? E, doğrusu çoğumuz bilmiyoruz. Hani bilmek zorunda da değiliz ama bir strateji eğer varsa <gülüyor> bunun bu, bu kadar sıcak, kavgalı bir dönemde kamuoyuna hissettirilmesi aslında olumlu bir şeydir. Eğer bir strateji yoksa sadece taktikle, sözle, e, konuşmayla devam eden bir durum varsa, yaklaşım varsa meselenin çözümünde bu taktiği hükümetin stratejiye dönüştürme çabası aslında çok yararlı olur. Ama biz bunun işaretlerini şu anda göremiyoruz. Kürtlerde bir 
deyim vardır. Şey derler. E, Devlet-i Rumi. We have to come to a close. Okay. Two minutes. Go ahead. E, Devlet-i Rumi derler. Bu aslında Bizans devleti geleneği. Türkiye meseleye hep böyle kenarından, arkasından dolanarak, zamana yayarak, erteleyerek e, yaklaşıyor. Ama bu ertelemenin Türkiye'nin çok e, lehine bir durum olduğunu ben düşünmüyorum. Şöyle ki, çünkü Kürtler artık eski klasik yöntemlerle e, kandırılabilecek e, bir topluluk değiller. Siyaseten oldukça organizeler. E, Deyasporadan, işte buradaki bölgesel hükümetten, ekonomik güçlerinden yeni alternatifler yaratabilecek imkanları, fırsatları var Kürtlerin. Kürtler bölgede bir aktör. Kürtler tarih sahnesine artık doğdular, varlar. Bu özneyle, bu doğmuş olan özneyle Türkiye'nin ne yapacağı meselesi aslında Türklerin meselesi. Bence düşünmesi gerekenler Türkler, Kürtler değil. E, Türkiye barış isteyen bir toplumu yedeğine alıp, yanına alıp daha da güçlenebilir. Ya da bunu yapamazsa bölge büyük bir kaosa sürüklenir. Ben alternatifin kaos ya da barış olduğunu düşünüyorum. Bir ara yolun da tüketildiğini düşünüyorum. Çok teşekkür ederim. Thank you very much. I propose that we collect a few questions and then, and then ask the panel to respond. You don't think I'm going to talk? Are you? <laughs> Go ahead. Boy, I mean, I'm, being a trustee it doesn't cut much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was I was asked by myself actually since <laughs> that I would be talking about the impact of the current crisis in Turkey on U.S.-Turkish relations. And um, let me start by saying that if you had asked me. If I, or I had asked myself that question a year ago, I would have probably said that Turkish-American relations were going through some kind of a golden age. The Turks and the Americans have never been this close. Uh, there were cooperation on many different levels. Uh, our president and Prime Minister Erdogan were really buddies and talking on the phone all the time. And yet, when uh, two weeks ago approximately, uh, President Obama called uh, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, it had been six months and eight days, according to Turkish journalists who keep track of these things. So for, from where they would talk very frequently, uh, Obama had essentially refused to talk to, to uh, Prime Minister Erdogan and had been sending all kinds of messages of his displeasure, including the cancellation of a trip by the Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, last month. So the Turkish-American relations actually from within a year have gone from being at the zenith to, an, uh, to a really low, uh, low point. And, and what is the reason for that? Ironically, the reason is purely Turkish domestic and purely crisis related in Turkey. It started all um, uh, obviously with the Gizi protest that IPEC uh, made reference to. Um, when there were demonstrations in Turkey and the police used uh, brute force, but it wasn't the force that the police used that upset uh, the West. Police everywhere does not nice things. I mean, that's why maybe they're police. But, um, but it is the discourse that came out from the AKP and Erdogan and all the AKP-controlled newspapers about a conspiracy, a conspiracy to overthrow the Turkish government, a conspiracy that has, that has been uh, mounted by a whole series of, um, depending on who you read and who you listen to, at the very least, the interest rate lobby, uh, Americans, um, uh, the Financial Times, the Economist, uh, Jews, uh, bankers, um, some newspapers claim it's the Queen of England, um, she, I'm sure she doesn't know that, um, <laughs> but, the, but it was the viciousness, if you want, and the, uh, of the discourse of attacking essentially your most important ally, especially after, two weeks after, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan was in, um, uh, in Washington and had dinner at the White House with his uh, foreign minister, whom you saw, and his the, um, intelligence chief at the White House. This is, 
the, the president doesn't invite people to his own house very often. So it was actually a big gesture on the part of Obama, and yet two weeks later, the same people were turning around and accusing essentially the, uh, the U.S. government and U.S. Uh, institutions. That created a shock in the United States. It created a shock in the sense that you got to, the administration quickly came to the, to the realization that even if the, uh, the government was using this as an excuse, the, at a very, very senior level in the Turkish government, they actually believed what they were saying. They actually believed that there was a conspiracy, that there was, they couldn't, the, the Gezi protests caught them by surprise. They never expected that there would be a challenge to the government in this form. Erdogan has turned essentially Turkey into a one-party, one-man state. It's not just him. I mean, it's also the fact that Turkey does not have an opposition to, to speak of. In, uh, it has been very ineffective. It got a lot worse on December 17th when as you heard, there's this uh, um, confrontation between this uh, um, guy called Tula Gulen, who happens to live in Pennsylvania, and, and the, uh, who has a huge network of schools and supporters and uh, businesses that he doesn't necessarily own. But anyway, uh, tape after tape of uh, uh, conversations started to come up. Four, four ministers had to uh, be forced out of the government, their sons arrested, people were found with tens of mil uh, millions of dollars in their homes, in shoe boxes. Um, I mean, clearly it was corruption, but as Nurai said, it's more than corruption. It was the abuse of power by a government that thought it could, nothing could stop uh, whatever it wanted to do. And again, the, the government and the pure um, uh, uh, conflict management accused the West, accused its, its, its allies, accused again everybody for th this conspiracy. Right? So what the problem for both for Europe and the United States is how do you do business with somebody who across, the, uh, across the, the table from you who essentially thinks that you're trying to overthrow him and that member, that country is a member of NATO. Now, the context is also important. This is a time when Turkey and United States have to do a lot of business together. On a daily basis, Turkey and United States do thousands and thousands of interactions. These have not changed. Right? You have to. You're a NATO, these are NATO members, there are American bases, there are economic and other interests. Uh, so the Turkish-American relationship is very intense. Yet, at now at a senior level, there's a great deal of uh, mistrust. Beyond that, the mistrust is also appearing on the one issue that is very, very critical to both countries, Syria. Already the administration in Washington was very unhappy at the idea that um, the, the Turks were supporting al-Nusra uh, elements. And increasingly, the impression is that Turkish foreign policy, or at least Turkish policy on Syria, has been outsourced to um, NGOs like there's a, a very famous NGO that was involved in the uh, Israeli ship uh, Blue Mavi Mama incident. Increasingly, uh, arms and people are being smuggled to these. So there is no common vision anymore on Syria, it seems. And yet, for the United States, if you're going to work on Syria, Turkey with its long border, Turkey with, its, uh, with the assets that the United States has, and the relationship it has had for years, that um, uh, it can no longer um, trust the, the, the, the, the Turks on Syria. But also beyond that, the, the crisis in Turkey has had one very important consequence, and that is that Erdogan is still, is still going to remain as a, as, as a central figure. He's not going away anytime soon. But he's no longer going to be seen as a transformative leader that he had aimed to be. The United States no longer look at, looks at him this way. But more importantly, I think the US sees him as, a, uh, as creating uncertainty and potential instability, and also creates uncertainty with terms, in terms of policies. What, you know, as this crisis, well, with Erdogan is so serious. I mean, 
uh, he has lost his legitimacy. Yes, there are law, large chunks of people who support him, and they will continue to support him because he has got a lot of services. I mean, he's done a lot of good work. Um, and yet, the divisiveness of his policies and uh, the fact that he has openly interfered with some of the most basic uh, issues of law and order, uh, uh, rule of law, freedom of the press, you have him on tape, and he has not denied it. Mr. Erdogan is in Morocco, he's watching Turkish television, and he doesn't like the type that goes underneath. He calls the station manager and says, you have to change the type. Now, which leader in the world, certainly in, in the Western world, would be caught saying this, and then not deny it and stay in power? Right? Such a, and then, you, you, in the context of the European Union process, it is very difficult to, for me to see how the Europeans, who already are, were lukewarm to the idea of Turkish adhesion, adhesion will, will now <coughs> want Turkey. In, in, in a way, he has, he has taken Turkey all this way, all this way, and now he's brought it, he's brought it back. So he has created a great deal of, uh, um, of, un, of uncertainty in the relationship. And the phone, phone call between Obama and Erdogan two weeks ago was one that it was very clear from what I gather that one that he did not want, Obama did not want to make, but he came, he realized that he had to say something because too much had gone by. And first, when you look at the readout also, they talked about a number of issues, but from what I understand, they spent an enormous amount of time with Obama saying, look, um, you, you need to cool it, you need to, to, to um, take care of issues in terms of the rule of law, in terms of interference in the press, interference in, in, in, the, in the justice system. But Turkey is, is now at, um, at a very critical point. The, the municipal elections of uh, March 30th are, are critical. Erdogan's party is still gonna come up on top as a, with the largest number, of, largest number of votes, but he is no longer the leader he is. And that will, that will affect the decisions that he takes and it is also possible, and the fear, I think, is um, that he will be increasingly erratic, and that may show itself up in foreign policy, in domestic policy, and I would say um, tighten your, um, um, what do you call the seat belts? <laughs> um, uh, no, fasten your seat, thank you. Fasten your seat belts. We're in for a very rough ride with Turkey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Mike. Mike. Some observations uh, which might be. Please, questions, no observations. Uh, he could. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No. Go ahead. First there, then here. All right, well, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving me this chance because uh, from yesterday I'm trying to ask uh, questions. Lots of people uh, try yeah. to ask questions. It's always a minority, the, the ones who can. So please let no one take offense. Look at the numbers and you will understand. Do thank the you. Math. Um, now, uh, I want to talk about uh, Kurdistan. I'm a Kurdish analyst. Uh, uh, uh, a question. Kurdish affairs right? Islam, no, no speeches. Sir, yeah, um, uh, geopolitics. Uh, map of Kurdistan is very important in the Middle East and my question is now uh, a Turkish boat is in the middle of the uh, Syrian Sea and uh, it's trying uh, until now is uh, uh, sending weapons to extremists and jihadists in Syria and I saw it uh, by myself what is the, the solution uh, to stop how to, uh, Turkey sending uh, weapons to extremists what is the solution now for Turkey? Thank you. Because, uh, the second question, sorry. Uh, Golan Erdogan uh, conflict, uh, we have Golan Erdogan conflict, and both of them have their organizations in southern part, Kurdish and KRG. Will we see a conflict in KRG between Golan and uh, Erdogan? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Later, uh. um, I have two questions. One of them is for... Please try to have one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the first question is for Ms. Nuray. Um, 
what do you think about the Turkmens in Iraq? I mean, what's going to happen if it's not an issue that we have now, but I believe it's a rising issue. What, what do you think will happen when, if, if Kurdistan gets its independency? Uh, I mean, you know that 30% of Turkmens live in Erbil and the others in the south, and they are divided. So how are they going to be... Um, how, how are they going to be divided or supported by Turkey? Or are they going to be supported ever? Thank you. Thank you. He stopped. So my question would be, what are Genghis Chandar's observations? <laughs> two more, two more. Okay. <laughs> Hello there. My question is, do the panel agree that the Turkey's present foreign policies in the region is toward bringing back autonom autonomous or Osmanis power? Okay. We have one here, and the observation transformed into a question. <laughs> And then we have to close, I'm afraid. Yeah. Tell him it's a question. Huh? Thank you all. Uh, I have uh, a question for uh, Henry. Uh, could you please tell us what are the main reasons for United States for not talking to PYD? Is there a possibility of a policy change in the lights of post-Geneva II? And uh, also, is Turkey, for our Turkish friends, all going to open up to the Syrian Kurds and also to the Kurds of Turkey more than coming with these very limited and timid uh, packages of democratization? Thank you. Thank you. And just the reformulated observation. No, that, no, no. he was going to make the effort. Huh? Well, it was... Doesn't he want it? No, I guess not. Okay, the lady in the back. Um, hello, everyone. I'm a student in AUIS. My question is for the panel. Um, in the last two days, uh, I've noticed that the um, bo both of the um, uh, former uh, advisor of the, prime, um, uh, of the president of Turkey and uh, Oglo, they have talked about Saikas Biko, um, which was a contract that was made back uh, during the Ottoman Empire, where, which Iraq was based on that, and Kurdistan was divided based on that. So I was wondering if Turkey is thinking of getting back to the Ottoman Empire time, and Kurdistan be a God forbid. Um, okay. federal country in there. So Thank you. Who wants to take, who wants to go first? You want to start with the U.S. question and Syria? Oh, yeah. The, the, um, the two questions that uh, came. One is, why isn't uh, the United States talk to um, the PYD? Brett is, uh, is here, so um, let me put it this way. We have Turkey, Turkey talks to the PKK today. Right? There's a peace process going on. The United States doesn't talk to the PKK because the PKK is on our terrorism list and our lawyers in the State Department and our government essentially works A, very slowly, B, it is afraid of its own shadow, doesn't move very quickly on these issues. Because the PYD is an offshoot of the PKK, it's unlikely anytime soon that you will have, um, um, unless the Turks tell, the, tell the, White, uh, the State Department and the White House, Please go and talk to the PYD. I don't see the Americans do it. Do, do it. And also, of course, there's this impression that there may be a tacit uh, understanding agreement between the PYD and, and the regime in, in Damascus. Um, the weapons to extremists, uh, look, 
When the Syrian war started, since the war started, everybody uh, made the same miscalculation with the exception of very few people, like Fabrice. And everybody said, well, you know, the regime is going to fall, the regime is going to fall. Turkey got very isolated in the process Tur because Syria was the most important case uh, of um, litmus case for its zero problems foreign policy that you heard some yesterday. And so Turkey got very frustrated as it saw that the Free Syrian Army could not um, fight very well, it decided to, to support and fund the al-Nusra elements who were clearly better fighters, better organized, more effective, and it was a way to speed up the process incorrectly, it turns out. Um, but at the time, everybody thought that the, the regime was going to fall in six months, so there was no preparation. And once the, the, it became obvious that that was not going to happen, Turkey went into extreme, uh, extreme options. So that's, that's my, my, my take on it. And by the way, Turkey is not, not, is not, doing, is not pursuing an Ottomanist foreign policy. It's very isolated today, so you can forget Ottomanism. Yeah, I was just going to take a crack at the Ottomanism questions that came up, and I agree with Henri that I think that the Turkish foreign policy, and especially um, uh, the, the current government, is very pragmatist and uh, very realistic, so I don't think that this is actually happening. But it's good domestic uh, policy material to talk about Ottomanism, and that's why it's taken such a, such a role. Right. As for and the di first the direct question about Turkomans, why uh, you directly asked me about Turkomans, I don't know, but I don't think that uh, such questions will be answered by Turks from Turkey. Because, uh, well, of course, I'm concerned with all, all people living in Iraq, but I'm not particularly, you know, I don't have answers about the prospects of Turkmen, and I need to know about their prospects, uh, and I need to get more information and ideas from you rather than, you know, commenting on the, uh, uh, on, on the future of Turkmen, uh, uh, you know, as an, you know, observer of, of politics, I, I, I, of course, I mean, I, I wish to see Turkmen's participating in politics where they live, uh, either uh, in yeah. Kurdistan, in regional government in Kurdistan, or concerning disputed areas. Uh, well, by definition, they are disputed areas. I mean, nobody knows about, you know, what sort of arrangement will be made. You know, uh, and what sort of consensus, consensus will be reached at the end? So I don't. I'm not inclined to detach the prospects of Turkmen from from the rest of you know the fate of the people who who are living in in this uh, area. Sorry, if you have something in mind. In. Well, I. In my principle, I refuse to compare. Or, uh, well, I mean, uh, as a matter of you know, intellectual debate, we may compare the situation uh, of Turkmen's with those of Kurds who are living in Turkey. But you know, by by principle, as a matter of principle, political principle, I I refuse to compare uh, the situation of Turkmen's in Turkey to the you know, situation of Kurds living in Turkey because these are two different, you know, issues. And uh, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't mean that, I mean, you know, if Turkmen are suffering from this and that under KRG, under, under Kurdish rule, then, you know, why they are, you know, coming up with all these demands uh, in Turkey, why Kurds are coming up. I mean, these are two separate things that should be, should stay separate because otherwise we would, you know, we, we then it, it means that I mean, we are basing our political judgments <coughs> and convictions on ethnic lines, which is not true. It's not my politics. Sorry. And um, Sorry. as for others, you know, I don't know. Very, very quickly. Very quickly, as for Ottomanism, actually, I don't agree with the pack that <coughs> the current... Sorry, I have to be stingy where other people have the privilege of being profligate and with time before me, but so no, no. Pardon, my, pardon my brutality. No, yeah. just, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to spoil my uh -huh. 
time. Uh, I don't agree with uh, the idea of tur current Turkish government is very pragmatic in terms of it's it, they were very pragmatic, but not anymore. That's why we had all these troubles concerning regional politics. And I think there is this nostalgia there. Uh, and and, and we, we, we have all sorts of shortcomings of this nostalgic right. you know, uh, idea of, of governing foreign policy. Thank you very much. Bajan, quickly. Yeah, quickly. Maybe it's better to say in English. Uh, I wanted to say something about this democratization uh, the process, about the peace process. Uh, in their mind, <coughs> the Turkish state and the government, they know there is a problem and they have to find a solution. And uh, what, uh, what we call this peace process. But is there peace process really? Is it a, a standard peace process? We don't know that. They don't have a strategy, or they don't, uh, we don't feel that. If they, if, even if they have, we don't feel that. I think in their mind, they, they behave like, as I say before, like a Byzantium state mentality they have, kind of. Uh, they wanted to go in a tricky way, and they wanted to uh, keep it slow as much as they can. And uh, this arm is the... Uh, first uh, solution they have to uh, find, but uh, still, even for that, they are going quite slow. I think they think uh, through constitution change or through some law uh, change, uh, they can give some cultural rights to Kurt, and uh, they are trying to find other words as they invited Mr. Barzani to the Arbakir, for example. For them, it was uh, a second uh, channel uh, which can balance the power uh, in, in Turkey, Kurdish power and Turkish power, because there was a kind of uh, uh, insurance for them. They always think uh, KRG power is the insurance for them. Uh, that's why I don't find them uh, sincere about the way they uh, try to construct this peace process. Uh, what we need is uh, sincerity and openness and, uh, uh, yeah, that's it. What On that I, note, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> A five minute break. Just five minutes. We start right away? Well. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we start the next panel immediately without a break, please. Please remain seated and in the conference hall because we are running late. Apologies for that, but the next panel is starting immediately. Thank you.
One, two, three. One, two, three. Testing. يلا تكاية همولا اقار داب نشن واو داس بيب كي بليز if you could be seated we could start we are short of time and this is our last session please be seated كاك باختيار help us no Please, thank you. Okay. No, I don't think so. Yalla, at Sawar, <coughs> we are going to start. This is our last session of a most wonderful two day of open democratic debate and dialogue in Suleimania Forum. Uh, really, this is my second participation in the forum, and I could see the change, both in terms of representation and logistics and facilities. So I want to thank the president of the American University uh, and Dr. Barham for organizing this and I hope uh, next year it will even be better. But if you allow me, I have a couple of uh, observations. Having participated in a number of this <coughs> kind of forum, I can speak from some experience. <laughs> uh, I think uh, Time management is very, very important in, in uh, this kind of gathering and this participation. So for the organizers, for uh, people actually who are running this event, uh, I think it's important. Uh, you cannot express everything you have in five, ten minutes, but at least to underline the main things. Second thing, I think it's important to limit the number of panelists also. Uh, to focus on those topics, let's say, who are most relevant, let's say, to, to, to the issues and the subjects. Um, I think another decision the organizer has to take consideration is the amount of media exposure you want. How much value do you want for people to speak openly from the heart or publicly? Uh, on the record, of the record, there are two different ways of managing it. But I leave it for you, really. I don't have any specific things. And uh, we have the most distinguished panel uh, here, actually. I, honestly, they don't need any introduction, uh, all of them. We have uh, a guest from Lebanon, the Minister of, of uh, Education and Higher Education. Uh, we welcome him most warmly. Uh, we, the rest, are well known to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Adel Abdel Mahdi, Brett McGurk, my colleague and friend, uh, uh, Wazir Al-Aloum and Technology, Wazamili, Fi Majlis Al-Nawab, Sayyid Abdel Karim Samurai. Mali, Mustadiq. أيضا صديقنا وعزيزنا زالم خليلزاد علاقتنا الشخصية والسياسية تدوم لعقود حقيقة لا أريد أن أقدم أي من الأخوة الحضور لأن في هذا الكراس يعني السي في everyone السي في is is here that you can refer to I'll start with عادل my good friend my long comrade in in and struggle against dictatorship, we fought for a new Iraq. We worked, we campaigned for a democratic, federal, and Iraq that respects human rights, and Iraq that would be prosperous, that would be friendly. Have we got that Iraq or not? Yes. Well, first, let me also appraise uh, the hosters Dr. Barham, the American University, 
this wonderful forum. And I hope that next year, certainly it will be better. It's better this year than last year. I hope Ma'am Jalal will be with us. He's always with us. <laughs> Another remark of what uh, our friend Hoshkar said, uh, I would prefer that the panelists have a small discussion before the pan five minutes, 10 minutes, how to organize the panel, what should be said, the topics, etc. As for the question, well, here we go to Arabic. أنا أعتقد أن العراق هو في ظرفه الطبيعي. ليس معنى ذلك أن الوضع صحي تماما. ليس معنى ذلك المشاكل قليلة. ليس معنى ذلك لا نواجه تهديدات كبيرة. لكن كما ذكر هذا الصباح، نحن بلد. في مرحلة الانتقال من دكتاتورية واستبداد طويلة الأمد لفترة طويلة جدا ربت بثقافات سيئة للغاية شديدة المركزية شديدة البيروقراطية شديدة الاستبداد ونريد أن نذهب إلى بلد ديمقراطي تعددي فدرالي فيه حقوق الإنسان مضمونة فيه الحريات العامة مضمونة فيه كافة حقوق الإنسان المرأة الطفل الشيخوخة فالمسير طويل أعتقد خلال عشر سنوات وأستعير كلام قيل في هذا الصباح إذا تركنا الصوت العالي هناك أمور كثيرة تحققت هناك أمور مهمة للغاية تحققت في العراق لكن لا يزال أمامنا أمور كثيرة لم تتحقق اليوم وجودنا في هذا البانل هو إنجاز كبير اليوم الوضع في كردستان تطور كثيرا مطارات مستشفيات جامعات حريات إلى حد كبير مؤسسات كلام عن دستور كل شيء يسير لكن بتعثر بصعوبات إذا استثنينا إذا أخذنا ما تم مناقشته من أمور أساسية في هذا المنتدى هناك ثلاث محاور أساسية المحور الأول محور العلاقات الإقليمية إيران تركيا سوريا تم إلقاء نظرة جيدة عليها لن نتدخل بها هناك الجانب المهم الذي خصوصا قيل هذا الصباح في شؤون المياه في شؤون النفط الذي قيل بعد ظهر هذا اليوم في شؤون الاستثمار هناك أشياء مهمة جدا قيلت وذكرت وكلام مهم الآن سمعناه في الاستثمار قد لا يتطابق مع المشاكل والصعوبات والعثرات التي نواجهها هناك أشياء كثيرة عندما يتكلم الأخ فاروق ويقول أنا مؤسسة خاصة ولدي لدي 30 ألف منتسب هذا إنجاز كبير هذا إنجاز سيقلد اليوم كثير من هذه المشاريع نراها تقوم في البلاد وستقوم أكثر أعود إلى تو بانلز ماذا بالعرب منصتين أو لقاءين حول العراق حول القضية الطائفية وحول العراق ومستقبل العراق العنصر الرئيسي الذي ذكر في هذه الاجتماعات في هذين الاجتماعات أن هناك الكثير من الطائفية وهذا صحيح وأن هناك كثير من الإقصاء وهذا صحيح وأن هناك أيضا كثير من القتل والقتل المضاد الإرهاب والعنف الميليشيات داعش الخطط الأمنية إلى آخره يجب أن نتفق وأعتقد هنا عدد كبير حاضر في هذه القاعة من مؤسسي العراق الجديد الدستور لم يعد خلال 
أربعة أشهر كما ذكر أخي وعزيزي الدكتور مهدي الحافظ الدستور بدأ هنا في صلاح الدين وفي فيينا في اجتماعات المعارضة طرحت كافة المبادئ الدستورية ونوقشت في مؤتمرات لندن ونوقشت في مؤتمرات صلاح الدين كافة المبادئ الدستورية لم لم يعد في ليلة ظلماء الدستور نقاش واسع بين القوى السياسية بين النخب بين الممثلين السياسيين وحتى بعد التغيير كانت هناك مرحلة قانون إدارة الدولة ومرحلة أخذت نقاش مفصل في كافة القضايا ثم مرحلة الدستور أيضا أخذت فترة طويلة جدا اليوم الدستور المصري أعد خلال أشهر قليلة الدستور الياباني كتب بأيدي أمريكية خالصة لم يكتب أيضا بأيدي يابانية في وقتها أخذ أشهر قليلة كتب بأيدي أمريكية خلال أشهر صوت عليه في برلمان انتخب وبعد أن وقعه الإمبراطور وأصبح نافذا خلال ستة أشهر المشكلة ليس في ورقة الدستور المشكلة في رجل الدولة والمسؤول هل يأتي إلى هذا النص ويعطيه الحياة؟ هل يضع القانون المطلوب لمجلس الاتحاد لكي لا نعاني مشاكل أو تشيك أند بالانسز بين بين المركز والإقليم أو بين المركز والمحافظات؟ نحن الذين نضع الروح في الدستور، في أي دستور في العالم وأظن ذكر أيضا هذا الصباح هناك جمود هناك نص جامد في الدستور لكن رجال الدولة هم يستطيعون أن يمزقوا الدستور ويضعوا دستورهم الشخصي فوق الدستور أو يستطيعون أن يعطوا الحياة إلى هذا الدستور بكل مضامينه الدستور العراقي كهشيار فيه أشياء كثيرة اليوم مليارات البشر تتمناها نحن الذين نستطيع أن نحترم هذا الدستور لا يمكن لأحد لا يمكن لأحد أن يأخذ مادة أو فقرة من الدستور وينسى المواد الأخرى لا يستطيع الكرد أن يأتوا ويركزوا فقط على المادة 140 لكن ينسوا القضايا الأخرى التي توجب عليهم عليهم التزامات أخرى لا يستطيع الشيعة أن يأخذوا الانتخابات والديمقراطية لكن انسوا شراكة الآخرين في هذا الوضع لا يمكن للإخوة السنة أن يعارض في البداية تأسيس الأقاليم والوقوف ضد الفدرالية وصديقنا زلماي شاهد في إعداد الدستور وكتابة الدستور المعارضة التي صارت لإدراج الأقاليم في الدستور واضطررنا أن نوقع ورقة أو أن يوقع السفير الأمريكي والسفير البريطاني معززين بتوقيع من الرئيس الطلباني والرئيس البرزاني أن هذه الإجراءات التي اضطررنا لحذفها من الدستور ستوضع في الدستور لاحقا وكان هو القانون الأول الذي شرع في الجلسة الأولى في مجلس النواب لاحقا نحن بحاجة أن نعيد هذه الأمور أنا أعتقد الجميع مسؤول عن هذه الأخطاء ليس الشيعة فقط ليس الكرد فقط ليس السنة فقط الجميع مسؤول عن هذه الأشياء الشيعة ركزوا على مركز واحد فظلموا أنفسهم ظلموا الآخرين الشيعة كان يجب أن يكونوا في رئاسة الجمهورية في مجلس النواب في كل مكان إذا كنا نتكلم عن جماعة كونستنتونسيز ونتكلم عن كوميونيتيز مكانهم في ذلك المكان في كل الاماكن ليس في موقع رئيس الوزراء او موقع السلطه التنفيذيه الذي يحاول ان ياخذ كل المواقع لنفسه كذلك الاكراد لهم مصلحه كبيره ان يكونوا في بغداد اقوياء لان في بغداد عندما يكونوا اقوياء سيكونوا ايضا اقوياء في كردستان وعندما نكون نحن أقوياء في كردستان نكون أقوياء أيضا في بغداد المسائل علاقات متبادلة كذلك 
فيما يخص الإخوة السنة بدون الشراكة الطبيعية مع الإخوة السنة لا يمكن محاربة الإرهاب لا يمكن إلا أن يكون السنة في الصفوف الأساسية وفي المواقع الأساسية لكي فعلا نستطيع أن نحارب الإرهاب الذي اليوم هو أزمة ومشكلة كبيرة تهدد الجميع زيرو منتس شكرا شكرا شكرا بارك الله <تصفيق> شكرا Our next speaker is another dear friend and uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Brett McGuirk. Brett actually has followed Iraq and the regional politics for many, many years in the White House, at the State Department, at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad for many years. And he is now uh, also responsible for Iraq and Iran. So one of the most important position, I would say, in the U.S. administration. Brett, my question to you, uh, last summer, I met uh, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, General Dempsey, who served in Iraq for many years. And uh, he has a very soft spot and a good heart for Iraq, for the people of Iraq, and for what they have done to, to help us. He told me something, really I want to ask you the same thing as a question. He said, uh, I believe your country, Iraq, is one of the most important country in the region. And uh, really when we discussed with him, he said Iraq has, everything comes together in Iraq. Terrorism. Iran, uh, development, uh, energy, oil production, investment, uh, managing the, the different uh, ethnic, sectarian uh, <coughs> pluralism of, of the society. So I want to make this statement really a question to you, uh, who you are responsible for your government policy toward my government. So we want you to share your views with us on your policy toward Iraq and the, the development in, in, in the region. Please. Uh, no, thank you, Hoshar. And let me first say I also want to thank Dr. Deckley and the university staff here and Dr. Uh, Barham. Uh, Barham's leadership, you just look around, and it's a testament to what dedication and tenaciousness and struggle can build. Um, it is really truly extraordinary because nothing was here uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so thank you for having us and for putting on this event. Look forward to being here next year and every year thereafter. I guarantee all these issues will mm. still be very hot topics. Um, just to address your question, um, I of course agree with General Dempsey. I think, um, and this is a conversation I know that, that many of us have had, um, I'm asked this when I'm testifying before the Congress. Uh, why should we still care about Iraq? Um, Americans suffered 30,000 casualties here, depending on who you count, who, how you count it, spent as much as a trillion dollars, and enough is enough. And it depends on the audience, but as you said, if you just look at it in terms of pure U.S. interests, and our policy is made by defining our interests and deciding how we want to allocate our resources and focus and attention and time, and in terms of uh, core, vital U.S. interests, uh, the question of al-Qaeda, oil, uh, the question of Iran, and everything else that is swirling through this region. All the issues of sectarianism that were discussed in an earlier panel here today. Uh, Iraq is the one place in which we, as United States diplomats, are routinely engaged with uh, Sunni leaders, Shia leaders, uh, in trying to work out real world problems and tangible problems. So I would say getting Iraq right is essential to getting every other issue in the region right. So our interests are tied up directly in the future of Iraq. And then not to mention, uh, for those of us who served here, um, all of those that we've suffered, Iraqi friends, American friends who've lost their lives here. Uh, we have no choice but to do everything we possibly can to improve the situation here and get it right. So you can look in, in terms of moral terms, but in terms of a U.S. official, and especially when we're talking to the Congress and all the difficult challenges we have at home, all of our core vital U.S. interests in the region are tied up right here in Iraq. So General Dempsey's right. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my next uh, <coughs> panelist and speaker uh, is a colleague at the cabinet, Dr. Abdul Karim Sabrai, Wazir al Ulum and Technology. اختصاصا حقيقة الموضوع مهم جدا كان والعراق عانى كثيرا كثيرا من العقوبات الدولية بسبب أسلحة الدمار الشامل وبسبب أسلوب وطريقة التخلص من أحكام الفصل السابع لخروج العراق وعودة إلى إلى الحظيرة الدولية ولا زالت بعض القضايا نتابعها سوية حقيقة في التخلص من ما تبقى قريبا في حلبشة سوف يعقد اجتماع مهم بمناسبة الذكرى السنوية لجريمة حلبشة ورئيس منظمة حظر الأسلحة الكيميائية سوف يحضر في هذه المناسبة سؤالي حقيقة إلى معاليك إحنا دا نحكي سياسة هسا يروح السياسة هسا أي عندنا يعني مشكلة في التوافق الوطني عندنا مشكلة في التمثيل بحثنا مسألة التوازن بحثنا مسألة الدستور حاليا عندنا مشكلة في الأنبار يعني مشكلة أمنية وسياسية ولا بد من هكذا منتديات حقيقة أن تتعرض إلى قضايا يومية ومعاصرة فالكل مع الحل السياسي والتسوية وبدون إراقة دماء ولحد الآن الحكومة نجحت إلى حد ما في عدم تحويل هذا النزاع إلى نزاع شيعي سني لحد الآن والمحاولات تبذل في سبيل احتوائها وإيجاد مخرج بالنسبة للكتلة السياسية اللي تنتمي إليها شنو العلاج للتخلص أو لإيجاد مشكلة قبل أن ندخل إلى الانتخابات الجاية في 30 من شهر نيسا تفضل شكرا جزيلا مع الوزير الخارجية وطبعا أنا أشكر أيضا دكتور برهم صالح حقيقة على إتاحة الفرصة هذه وشكري وتقديري للجامعة الأمريكية ويعني للقائمين عليها أنا أعتقد هذا الملتقى هو ملتقى مهم للغاية كانت فيه جلسات وحوارات وأسئلة مميزة للغاية صحيح أن هناك بعض الملاحظات لم هي تتعلق في طبيعة الإدارة ربما في بعض الأحيان ولكن بهذا العدد الكبير اللي حضر حقيقة وبهذا بهذه المحاور اللي توسعوا فيها المتحدثين أنا أعتقد تحصل مثل هكذا أمور طبعا بالتأكيد أنا ربما سأتكلم يعني بشكل عام عن التحديات اللي تواجه العراق بشكل واركز على ما طلبت مني مع الوزير حول موضوع الانبار خصوصا ونحن مقبلون على الانتخابات. لا شك ان الارهاب هو طبعا يعني خطر يداهم العالم وخصوصا منطقتنا منطقه الشرق الاوسط والخطر الحقيقي من الارهاب هو ان ان هؤلاء المجاميع الارهابيه اصبحوا كانهم مرتزقه يعملون لصالح اجنده خارجيه وربما اجهزه مخابرات ودول اقليميه هي التي تحدد طبيعه عمليات المجاميع الارهابيه في المناطق التي تحددها لصالحها وهذا اخطر ما موجود حقيقه في الارهاب. اليوم المجاميع الارهابيه هي تعمل ليس بسبب الايديولوجيه اللي تحملها فقط، نعم صحيح أنها هي لها أيديولوجية تكفر الجميع و يعني تحكم على العملية السياسية كلها بالانهيار وما شاكل ذلك ولكن الشيء الخطير في الإرهاب أنه الآن هو متبنى من خارج الحدود العراقية ويعمل لصالح وتحقيق هذه الأجندة أود أن أركز على أن هذا الإرهاب وهذه المجامع الإرهابية سواء كانت القاعدة أو داعش أو ما شاكل ذلك أو غيرها هي لا تمت ولا ترتبط وليس لها علاقة بالسنة مطلقا أخواني 
لان هؤلاء يعني لهم طبيعه خاصه، لهم افكار خاصه، لهم اجنده خاصه يعملون ضمن هذه الاجنده. يوم امس البارحه وانا جالس في الجلسه الصباحيه هنا اتصلوا بي من سامراء مدينتي وقالوا لي ان سبعه ارهابيين انتحاريين دخلوا الى مجلس مدينه سامراء مجلس مدينه سامراء وقتلوا عدد من الشرطه ومن الموظفين وبعدين كلهم انفجروا طبعا هم مفخخين فانفجروا وقتلوا وجرحوا وكانت حصيله حقيقه مدمره اذا ايش علاقه هؤلاء بالسنه قطعا هؤلاء لا يرتبطون بالسنه ولا نقبل ان يحمل السنه اخطاء هؤلاء المرتزقه الخارجين عن الاخلاق والقانون وكل الاعراف الاخلاقيه والانسانيه والدوليه من الامور الخطيره التي تتشكل حقيقه حتى في المنطقه هي موضوع الطائفيه وقد ركز الكثير من المتكلمين وكان اخرهم دكتور عادل عبد المهدي حول موضوع الطائفيه وفعلا هذه الطائفية أصبحت يعني مقلقة خصوصا وأنه أصبحت لها محاور هذه المحاور بعضها ليست داخل العراق وإنما أيضا محاور إقليمية واليوم يعني المشكلة السورية إلى الآن ما انحلت بسبب هذه المحاور التي تحولت للأسف الشديد إلى ممارسات طائفية خطيرة جدا لذلك نحن نحاول جهد الإمكان كنخب سياسية أن نتجاوز هذه القضية وأن نستمر فيما بدأنا به من اختيارنا للعملية السياسية وممارسة الديمقراطية في اختيار ممثلي الشعب واختيار حكومات ممثل الشعب إلى نهاية المطاف لعلنا نوفق حقيقة على الرغم من المشاكل الكبيرة التي تواجهنا وخصوصا في المرحلة الحالية من الأخطار الكبيرة التي نحن باستمرار نقع فيها هي عدم الالتزام بالدستور عدم الالتزام بالدستور بل وليس فقط عدم الالتزام وانما البعض يفسره كل واحد يفسر مواد الدستور حسب يعني ما يرتئيه وانتم تعلمون انه نص الدستور على تشكيل محكمه اتحاديه بعد التصديق عليه ولكن للاسف هذه المحكمه الاتحاديه الى الان لم تشكل على ضوء ما جاء في الدستور الى الان ولا لم يصدر قانونها ولم يتم اختيار اعضائها والمحكمه الحاليه نعم هي ماكو غيرها ماكو غيرها تفسر الدستور لكن هذه ليست من صلاحيتها تفسير مواد الدستور الحالي لكن مع ذلك هذا هو الموجود وهذا طبعا هو الخلل اليوم حتى المشكلة الموجودة بين الإقليم والحكومة الاتحادية حول موضوع النفط هو مبني على الدستور على ما جاء ببعض التناقضات الموجودة في مواد الدستور وبالتالي هذا الدستور الذي نحن كلنا صوتنا له في اللحظات الأخيرة أعطينا إحنا موافقة عليه بسبب إضافة مادة تنص على ضرورة تعديلها لكن للأسف الشديد لم يتم تعديل الدستور قلنا لازم أربعة شهور تتشكل لجنة وتعدل الدستور ويصوت على التعديل وشكلنا لجنة في الدورة السابقة كنا أنا وعديد من الزملاء أعضاء مجلس النواب الآن في مجلس النواب تشكلت اللجنة أربع سنوات كتبت تعديلات هائلة لكن لم تمس جوهر الخلافات وبالتالي رحلت القضية وهذا طبعا هي مشكلة ترحيل المشاكل نحن ندخل في مشكلة مشكلة ثم نرحلها نأجلها ثم بعد ذلك ندخل في مشكلة أكبر من عدها واحدة من عندهم قضية المظاهرات في الأنبار اللي أشار إلها معالي وزير الخارجية واللي طلب من عندي إيضاح حولها سنة كاملة طلعت مظاهرات في عدة محافظات ولكن وعدهم مطالب والكثير من عندهم قالوا هذه مطالب محقة مطالب يعني أيدها الدستور لكن لم يحصل شيء بارز في تنفيذ هذه الحقيقة المطالب وبالتالي رحلت وحصل شيء أكبر من عدها واليوم اللي موجود في الأنبار حقيقة شيء خطير استغل ما موجود في, في الأنبار اليوم من قبل بعض المجامع الإهرابية كداعش وغيرها ودخلت إلى هذه المدن الحمد لله الموقف في الرمادي في مدينة الرمادي جيد سيطرة العشائر التي هي طبعا كل عشائر العراقية ترفض الإرهاب وترفض هذه المجاميع وليس لها علاقة بها ولكن حصلت أخطاء القصف اللي حصل على مدينة الفلوجة القصف الهائل وإحنا طبعا في مجلس الوزراء صوتنا في بعض الذكر يعني أستاذ أبو كريم يعرف أنه إيقاف القصف لكنه بالأخير اليوم أكوى حوالي 300 ألف نازح ومهجر من مدينة الفلوجة إلى خارج محافظة الأنبار
وبالتالي هذا كله عبء ايضا يصير على الحكومه، عبء يصير على الناس ونحن مقبلون على انتخابات واستحقاق انتهاء انتخابي مهم. المهم نحن نامل ان تحل هذه المشكله، هذا يحل في تقديري بدعم العشائر التي هي يعني مسانده للاجهزه الحكوميه في محاربه الارهاب. هذه العشائر طبعا بعضها اعتمد على نفسه داخل الرمادي ولم يسمح لاحد من عناصر داعش ان يدخلوا فيها في مناطقهم. بفلوجه ما ما ما حصل هذا بسبب اختلاف الرمادي عن الفلوجه وسيطرت مجاميع من داعش والقاعده على اجزاء كبيره من الفلوجه ولحد الان الموقف خطير. نحن نقول العشائر ينبغي دعمها لكن دعمها ضمن ضوابط ولا تكرر نفس الاخطاء السابقه. انتم تعلمون ان هذه المحافظات حاربت القاعده في عام 2007 و2008 واستطاعت بفضل مشاريع الصحوات في ذلك الوقت ان تخرج كل المجاميع الارهابيه وتطرد القاعده من كل المحافظات. لكن بعدين مشروع الصحوه تبخر ولم نستطع الحفاظ حتى على رجال الصحوات وبالاخير اصبحوا عزل واستهدفوا من قبل القاعده وقتلوا ويوميا يقتل عناصر من الصحوات القديمه. فلا بد ان نعطي ثقه للعشائر بانه نحن اليوم اذا وقفتم مع الاجهزه الامنيه لا والله لكم مستقبل وطبعا اكو قرار ايضا من مجلس الوزراء بتوظيف حوالي 10000 من العشائر اللي تتقف مع لكن هذا كله يحتاج الى اليات سريعه واعطاء ثقه وابراز دور لهم في محاربه الارهاب. يعني انا ما اخشى يعني اخشى ان اطول في الكلام ولكن انا اقول اخواني اليوم المخاوف الحقيقيه عندنا وعند الكثير من المشاركين في العمليه السياسيه من انهيار هذه العمليه السياسيه. اليوم العمليه السياسيه على المحك حقيقه لهذه الاسباب اللي ذكرتها وايضا اسباب اخرى ان تنهار هذه العمليه السياسيه وبعد لا تبقى انتخابات لان الديمقراطيه هي ليست فقط انتخابات. الديمقراطيه هي ثقافه هي ممارسات هي هي هي هي يا رغبه بالتداول السلمي للسلطه، انا من اجي افوز اعرف انه لي مكان سواء في مجلس النواب او في الحكومه بالمستقبل. وبالتالي يعني تصير حتى نتائج الانتخابات تصطدم بتاويلات وتفسيرات تدرون ان القائمه العراقيه فازت في الدوره السابقه وب 91 مقعد لكنها لم تتح لها الفرصه ان تاخذ او يعني تمارس حقها في تشكيل الحكومة بسبب أن هناك تفسير لأحد المواد وليس 76 بين الكتلة الأكبر هي الكتلة التي تشكل بعد الانتخابات وليس قبل الانتخابات وهذا حقيقة من العجائب الغرائب التي تحصل في تفسير الدستور على كل حال نحن كجزء من العملية السياسية كجزء من الكتل السياسية المشاركة كجزء من الحكومة نحن سنبقى حريصين كل الحرص على أن نبقى داعمين لهذه العملية السياسية وللانتخابات ولكي نستمر في جميعا في محاربة الإرهاب ومقارعته لكن أيضا لابد أن تتحدد هوية هوية الدولة ما هي هوية الدولة الحالية هل هي هوية مواطنة أو هوية مكونات إذا كانت هوية مكونات فلا بد أن يعطى لكل مكون حقه ولو طبعا هذا هو ليس صحيحا لأن هذا يعزز ويكرس نوعا ما من الـ يعني الـ الطائفية السياسية أو ما نسميها في أي مصطلح آخر آآ لكن هي ليست بالتأكيد ليست دولة مواطنة نحن نسعى إلى أن نؤسس دولة مواطنة يكون فيها المواطن هو الهوية وهو العنوان وهو الهدف الذي نخدمه نحن جميعا وجزاكم الله خير شكرا جزيلا وآسف على الإطار دعنا شكرا على الوقت I'm so pleased that all our panelists are really sticking to the time. Yeah. So thank you very much. Now, uh, my friendship with Zal goes back to 91, myself and Barha. At that time, there was a policy in the United States not to speak to Iraqi oppositionists. And all the doors of the State Department, the White House, everywhere were closed actually. At the time, the United States was at war with, with Iraq. The one person who opened his door for us at the Pentagon was Zalmi Khalilzad. I mean, he, contrary to the formal official policy, he received us at the Pentagon. He's never he never That's right. Uh, thank you. Second, uh, 
<coughs> memory actually I have of, of Zal. We, as Dr. Adel said and mentioned actually, this political process did not start in a couple of, of, uh, of months to finalize the Constitution or, in fact, started a long time ago. But I remember in the uh, Salah Haddin conference just before the war, Zal was the official representative of, of the president for Iraqi opposition of free Iraqis. And uh, in his speech, he, he, he mentioned something not many people really picked it up, but uh, I think I did. He said, help is on its way. And uh, then actually later it was indeed, you see, that the uh, Saddam Hussein regime was toppled by the international coalition. And we were freed from this decades of, of dictatorship. Zal, since then, actually, he's been an ambassador to, to Iraq, to Afghanistan. He was the permanent representative uh, of the <coughs> United States mission in New York. He helped us a great deal, actually, uh, at the Security Council to get Iraq out of the sanction regime especially in relations with Kuwait, to review all the Security Council resolutions <coughs> uh, imposed on Iraq during Saddam's era. And since he has left, actually, he's been a keen follower of Iraqi politics, too. So my question to you, Zal, really give me four points okay, <laughs> that we need to move forward. Uh, and what, what needs to be done, really, to, to, to get this great country right, you see, and to grasp this opportunity to overcome the current difficulties. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. I'm humbled by your introduction, and, uh, and I'm very happy and, and grateful that I have the opportunity to uh, come back to uh, Soleimania to... Uh, Kurdistan to Iraq and be an institution uh, like this, uh, the American University of Iraq in Sully. And this speaks itself of the progress uh, that uh, this region and Iraq has made. And uh, uh, of course, there are problems. Uh, I uh, gather from what the former Vice President uh, Adel Abdel Mahdi, my friend, said, uh, I associate myself with the conceptualization that uh, a lot of progress has been made, uh, but there is need for a lot of reform uh, as well, uh, for change as well. So it's, uh, and what uh, reform, we're not going to talk about uh, the positive changes that have been made that should be used as a foundation for progress, but what reform? Uh, first, uh, I believe uh, that one of the challenges that Iraq has faced uh, since the change uh, has been the absence of consensus on some fundamental issues among Iraqis. And as the process of constitution uh, that I had the honor of seeking to facilitate agreement among Iraqis on, and all of, uh, several of my colleagues who are sitting here on the panel uh, played vital roles in. Uh, we tried to make as much progress as we could uh, to, to, to get to consensus. But there were some issues on which we couldn't achieve consensus on. I'm happy to say that, uh, that uh, there is progress towards consensus on one aspect which was a, a, a quite a big problem, and that is federalization of Iraq. Should Iraq be a, a unitary state, or should it be a, a, a federal state? I think most agree that it uh, uh, should be federal with regard to Kurdistan. But beyond Kurdistan, there was uh, a vital disagreement. A lot of people, uh, I uh, would say from the uh, parties uh, that were opposed to Saddam or uh, Shiite parties, I don't like to refer to sectarian uh, differences, but 
uh, at that time were favorable, the most important components were favorable to federalization of the rest of the Iraq. But quite a lot of secular and, and, and what let's call Sunni political forces were against uh, federalization. They saw federalization as a step towards disintegration of Iraq, towards weakening Iraq. And uh, uh, uh, I see now uh, that uh, there is greater support in the areas that where there was opposition to federalization for federalization uh, of their areas. And I think uh, the, uh, how to actualize that, how to get an agreement in terms of both time frame for this to happen and support for it, if this uh, develops, it's a very important thing. I believe myself that uh, um, when you have a society, uh, and I say this of course with all the uh, uh, affection for Iraq, uh, that is made up of not only citizens as individuals, citizens as, as communities, but citizens as, uh, as, as, as entities, who sometimes uh, ethnic entities who identify themselves as, sometimes identifying themselves as religious or sectarian entities, for a period until this changes, for the period until this changes, federalism and power sharing is the, is the only option to continuing instability and conflict or dictatorship. And I believe that, uh, that uh, uh, Iraq is at a point uh, this, uh, uh, where uh, it needs to, it needs to, uh, uh, uh, it is a constitution is federal. Uh, it is the, how it is being exercised on which, besides federalization, uh, this is, uh, this, uh, this has to be, uh, uh, uh, uh, this has to be navigated better, if you like. And I think the foreign minister in his uh, earlier comment that uh, this is what we need, na better navigation. And I think this is, what elections are uh, to, to, to adjust navigation to leadership is very important. In places where institutions are weak, and in Iraq, they are not very, uh, necessarily very strong. Leadership is vital. And if you get in, the, in, in leadership uh, good navigators, uh, we, we, they know where to take the country and have a strategy and a plan and, and, and a commitment, and that makes a huge difference. And, and, and, and I, I, I wish Iraqis well on that. That's the point uh, one. Point two is that uh, uh, I think for a while we played a very, the United States played a very uh, disproportionate low role for reasons uh, of, of, that you all are aware of. We uh, were the agents of, of the overthrow, in a sense, the instrument and the architects of some of the steps, the facilitators of other steps, uh, uh, but now our role uh, uh, uh, has, has changed. Uh, necessarily so, I have actually been a critic of that we've gone too far the, uh, uh, the other way. I would have uh, liked to see some U.S. forces stay uh, for some additional period in Iraq and a more engaged uh, uh, uh, and active still U.S. role, but what we were doing was not sustainable, and the American people, uh, as uh, my friend Brad said, uh, a lot of blood and treasure had been spent. This vacuum uh, that has been created by the withdrawal of this very powerful element is now being filled in a competitive way by regional powers. Iraqis, of course, I'll come to that, but by regional powers. Second thing that Iraqis should do, uh, in my view, is uh, to be the place uh, to, uh, uh, with, for ideas and activities uh, to regulate, limit, perhaps even evolve that regional rivalry to cooperation. I thought the vice president, that, uh, uh, uh, former vice president, uh, had some suggestions on that. Uh, you, uh, Mr. Minister. Just and where do you start? How do you start? Not to be the victim of of kind of uh, the rivalries of, of the region, and and and and 
Uh, and I believe uh, that uh, that's uh, very important, to be a place with ideas, suggestions, pushing for a, a balanced relationship regionally. That's what and a regulated relationship because of Iraq's uh, uh, composition and where it's located and the forces that are at work on it. Third thing is uh, uh, uh, staying out of uh, regional conflicts. Staying out of regional conflicts because of the, uh, uh, uh, the uh, uh, I think the Syrian conflict has had a very negative effect. There hasn't been really a one Iraq policy towards Syrian conflict. There have been, at the minimum, three, or maybe more, uh, uh, uh, policies uh, towards Syria. Very important for a, a country that is as building itself, building its institutions, institutionalizing itself, to be dragged in uh, uh, into uh, uh, the geopolitical uh, policies uh, of, of, of, of, of others. And I, I would say, uh, consensus building, uh, promoting regional cooperation, three, uh, uh, uh, staying out of others' conflict. A fourth and final point, uh, I would say, is uh, uh, uh, with regard to rule of law. No country can succeed, in my view, ultimately, and our vision for the sacrifices that the United States has made was that the Middle East as a region was creating problems for the world and we were hoping, uh, not only because of the specifics uh, of Iraq and Afghanistan, but also because of the broader uh, dysfunctionality that this region one day will become, uh, perhaps unrealistically so, one day uh, become like Europe, learn from uh, the mistakes of the past, become a region of democracy, freedom, prosperity, rule of law, where you can achieve greatness not by fighting each other, but by cooperating. And that maybe you needed to be a catalyst for some change that would have uh, a spillover effect. Maybe we have succeeded, maybe we haven't. We, ten years in the history of the world is a very short time. Uh, we will uh, be judged eventually, maybe in 100, 200 years, what happened at, uh, here. But I think the experience of successful societies show, the experience of successful societies shows that the rule of law and treating equal, everyone, every citizen equal before the law is a necessary requirement for success. And here I think uh, we know that Iraq has made progress. Uh, the Vice President uh, mentioned that. But I think uh, uh, implementing the Constitution, all the institutions that have to be established that have not been established as seen in the Constitution, and a judiciary that's really independent and treats everybody equally is vital for success. So I would say, Mr. Vice President, uh, Mr. Minister, maybe uh, there may be something ahead for you, but uh, is, is, is uh, one, consensus and navigation, uh, two, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, helping with regulating regional competition, especially the effects of Iraq, three, staying out of others' war, four, rule of law, progress with regard to rule of law. Those would be my four Thank suggestions. You. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, our last speaker is uh, a dear guest from Lebanon, Ma'ali uh, al-Wazir Hassan Diab, Wazir al-Tarbiya wa al-Ta'lim al-Ali fi Jumhuriya al-Lubnaniya, ahlan wa sahlan biik. Ma ba'arif asalak su'al wala anda kalima tuhub tilqiha? عندنا أسئلة عديدة في مشتركات أيضا مع تجربة اللبنانية في مسائل كثيرة ولكن أترك الحرية لمعاليك تفضل روج باش روج باش بخير بن Dor supas kakoshiar. Sir, ciao. We are making progress. Huh? <laughs> it is a great privilege to be here among such a distinguished group of politicians, practitioners, and academicians.
I have thoroughly enjoyed these past two days. Thanks to His Excellency Barham Saleh for his kind invitation and for organizing with his team this unique forum. Although I attended similar events outside the region, however, as was mentioned by His Excellency, it is important that the venue of events that address regional challenges be in the region itself. Therefore, holding this forum under this theme in our region, in Iraq and in Sulaymaniyah at AUI is an achievement in its own right. My presentation will be on education as a tool to address regional challenges with Lebanon as the case study since Lebanon has many similar characteristics to Iraq. The best contribution any politician can make is in the provision of quality education for his people and this is what His Excellency in his unique vision has achieved through establishing a non-profit high quality university. People in Lebanon still celebrate Daniel Bliss, founder of the American University of Beirut in 1866. And I'm sure that the people of Sulaymaniyah and Kurdistan region will celebrate your vision for many, many generations as founder of AUI. Our region is witnessing major challenges in terms of transition to globalization, which, is in, which in turn has faced sectarian, religious, and ethnic difficulties due to the lack of the culture of coexistence and dialogue. As such, it is important to be able to navigate through these recurrent regional political tsunamis. For example, in Lebanon, we had to face the impossible task of managing over 1.5 million Syrians coming across our border at a time when Lebanon is facing political divisions, uh, economic turmoil, security problems, among others. To minimize the growing pains of democracy and in light of the dynamically and rapidly changing world, political systems within our region need to be flexible in reviewing and updating their laws and constitutions to meet the aspirations of its people. The only way forward to address many of our regional difficulties is through dialogue and respect by all for all. Former Pope John Paul II said when he visited Lebanon many years ago that Lebanon is not only a country, it is also a message. Indeed, it is a message to the world. With over 18 different confessions from different religions and various ethnicities, Lebanon represents a unique social mosaic. Therefore, failure of Lebanon, of the Lebanese model, is not only a failure for Lebanon, but also the region and the whole world. Of course, Lebanon's success gives hope to the region and the world. People of this region want a better life and strive to improve the lives of their children. And this is their right. No doubt, good education plays a pivotal role in achieving this objective. You may know that the motto of AUB, where I am vice president, that they may have life and live it more abundantly. Some of the regional challenges mentioned in this forum include inclusive identity, governance, economic aspects. I would also like to add two more challenges. Cultural diplomacy. The challenge here is to overcome sectarian and ethnic board borders to lead to an environment that is enriching to all rather than confrontational, as His Excellency the Ambassador has just mentioned. Regional political systems should produce a new common vision for the countries that promote peace and tolerance among its people. Soft diplomacy should always be the way to solve our regional challenges. The other challenge I would add would be equality. Similar to existing quotas based on sectarian and religious factors, for true democracy, there should also be similar quotas for enhancing the role of women and youth in our political systems. It is our duty to listen to the dreams and aspirations of our youth as they represent the future of our region. Our ultimate and sustainable wealth in the region is not oil. It is not gas. It is not our natural resources, although all of these are multipliers, economic multipliers, as was mentioned before. Ladies and gentlemen, our true wealth is our youth that represent the future of this region. The solution for most of the problems facing our region lies in education. Education is not only basic education and higher education, 
but also lifelong education. Our educational systems should produce global citizens who can adapt to the dynamically changing world. Graduates that acquire 21st century skills and that are not only proficient in their area of specialization, that represent their depth of knowledge in the subject matter of their major, but also breadth of knowledge that equips students not only with communication skills and languages, but also tolerance and respect and appreciation of other cultures among many other necessary skills in today's complex world. I ask, how many of the over 800 universities in our region are doing that? Ministries of education, higher education, and vocational and technical education have the moral responsibility to integrate changes into our educational systems within the region to promote interreligious and intercultural respect and dialogue. I say those who have the knowledge and power to make a change have the responsi responsibility to act. I'll give you an example. An event was held in Jordan for ministers of education in the region to address the Arabic language weaknesses of high school graduates in the region. Believe it or not, I was the only minister to attend. During my tenure as Minister of Education and Higher Education, for almost three years, the ministry accomplished many achievements in the form of hundreds of ministerial decisions, decrees, and laws. This included many new initiatives for the first time, such as introducing entrepreneurial teaching in our basic educational curricula, a new law for compulsory education, compulsory community service in high school education, a new strategic plan for ICT use in education, a law to create a National Council on Quality Assurance for Higher Education, and so on and so forth. This is the book of the achievements of the Ministry of Education and Higher Education. That's why I didn't spend time in the media. I was busy writing this book, which is out a week ago. So when I'm asked, what did you do in the three years, I give them a copy of this book. I will mention only two achievements assessed by international bodies, and not by Lebanon. The first, in a recent report of the World Economic Forum, which ranks 144 countries in various sectors. The report said, Lebanon received the following excellent ranking in higher education. One, quality of business schools, ranked 13 of, out of 144. Two, quality of educational system, 10 out of 144. And quality of teaching math and science, number four out of 144, preceded only by Singapore, Finland, and Belgium. This is not our evaluation. This is the World Economic Forum. Mm. Another achievement, which I received two weeks ago in the form of a letter, indicating that as a result of the ministry actively encouraging the innovative use of mobile technologies that deliver long-term and sustainable socioeconomic benefit and well-being for their citizens, Lebanon was judged for the first time the winner of the GSMA 2014 Connected Government Award. Of course, the conditions in Lebanon over the past three years were very comfortable with the political divisions, and the environment was very serene with the security situation, not to mention the educational tsunami that represented by, Syrians, uh, by Syrian students increasing admission in the public school system by a sudden 70%. Also, being a technocrat minister in a political cabinet did not make my life any easier. This goes to show where there's a will, there's a way. On a different note, cultural and religious diversity constitutes one of the main characteristics of Lebanon's social mosaic and shapes the unifying national identity. Education and coexistence lies in developing common citizenship values that carry this cultural and religious diversity. Accordingly, this led me to introduce a development plan with citizenship education as one of its pillars by taking the following steps. The first, to approve a decree for the first time to implement social service or community service by all students in high school starting the academic year 2013-14, this academic year. And the second, introduce modern citizenship education concepts by including them in school curricula, especially in the civic education course. Accordingly, the ministry celebrated a year ago the launch of the National Charter on Religious Diversity and Inclusive Citizenship Education that shall form the basis of approaching citizenship in its different dimensions through education. Finally, I would like to say that as a citizen of the region, 
I have a dream of a new Middle East that one day we will have the courage to form a democratic union among nations in the region while respecting territorial, political, and geopolitical rights similar to the EU. Ladies and gentlemen, where are the institutions and organizations that form the catalyst for all countries in the region in all sectors, including R&D, economic, education, tourism, among many others? Our region has dealt with so many missed opportunities, and it is time to change that. War is not the solution to any problem, and might is not right. On the contrary, right is might. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate that the solution to many of our regional challenges lie in three pillars, education, education, and education. Reggie Cold. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Hassan Diab, uh, for your excellent presentation. Thank you. In fact, we are going to conclude, but I have a few remarks. Uh, over the last two days, I was so eager to participate in every panel and to speak, but uh, really I reserve my right, I gave it to the student, but I have a few <laughs> remarks to make. Uh, and this is my right as a citizen of this country uh, from my own observation. In fact, uh, we recognize that uh, the Iraqi national consensus that built the new Iraq, that many <clears throat> freedom fighters fought for, is really under threat. But that doesn't mean that this country is crashing. Right. It doesn't mean that this country is, is failing. It doesn't mean that dictatorship would re-emerge again in this country. I think we are luckier than other countries who are struggling, despite all our observation, that we have the constitutional, the legal framework of, for addressing our problems. This many others don't have it. Second point that make one optimistic is that politics have taken over in this country. Despite the conflict, the problems we have in Anbar, in Samarra, in other places, really it has not led to an open confrontation or people resorting to arm or violence to settle conflicts. The current problems between the KRG and Baghdad, I personally believe that they are manageable, they can be resolved with goodwill, with good intention, with mutual compromises. And everybody will, will gain from that. Uh, the other fact that has been established in the new Iraq, not a single sect or a single nationality or a single personality can rule this country anymore has to be through consensus building, there has to be through coalition. Winners cannot take all at all. Still, we're, we are in that process. We need from our friends, our allies, from the United States, from Turkey, from Iran, from the Arab countries, to help us, to be engaged, not to be dismissive that what happened in Iraq doesn't concern them. I think the failure of, of Iraq really will impact the entire region. We've heard about the Syrian ramifications and so on. It has been going on for the last three years, and it has impacted us, the spillover and so on. But for Iraq as a country in the heart and the soul of the Middle East, really it will be detrimental to everybody, and it will not be confined at all to the borders of, of Iraq. We've seen also there are signs of progress on economy, on investment, on other areas. Still, we are behind. Definitely, we need better navigating skills. And the upcoming election is, is, is a test for the Iraqi educated electorate, really, to choose their representative wisely to lead this country to a better future. As for federalism or, or uh, centralism, I think we all have agreed that this country should have a workable, a functioning federal structure.
full stop. You can't have it both ways. Constitutionally, you are entitled to a federal system of governance, and you cannot rule according to a centralized version of the old regime. Finally, I'd like to invite my good friend, Dr. Barham, to say a few concluding remarks. And the president of the American University, I will make one. Can I have two uh, Yes, I will make uh, one uh, final thing. I have a flight I need to take, but if you want to continue, please <laughs> add them. You can, <laughs> you can take all the questions. So I'll take but I, I, I promised uh, one of the students really to give her the floor to ask a question. Uh, Dina. Yes. Uh, where are you? Where is Wasta? she? Yeah, hi, Wasta. This is a planted question. Yes, please. Brother. Thank you, Minister Zebari. Um, I just want to say thank you for giving me the chance. Um, this is a planted question, and it's related to all AUIS students. That's why I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Brett McGurk. Uh, we all know how much the U.S. State Department has helped this university and supported it, but there is one thing that we don't understand, we as AUIS students, is how come... Um, we, as the students uh, studying in American-style liberal arts education, we, we are not eligible in Fulbright grant. Uh, we would really appreciate it if we could... <laughs> we would really appreciate it if you could um, help us understand and explain the reasons. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the planning question. Um, <laughs> And hopefully we'll have the opportunity for a few more questions about the other issues we discussed. Let me just say to all the students here, uh, we fully support you in this regard. It was very significant that Ali Adib was here yesterday, um, that uh, Dr. Dekla was talking to him about that. And we're going to do everything we can to get this fixed so that you can go study all around the world through our Fulbright program. So you have my commitment to follow that up, not only uh, with you here and with your leadership, but most especially in Baghdad. because. Um, uh, we need to fix this and make sure that you can go study all around the world under our Fulbright program. Great. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, last word, my last word, I really want to thank all the panelists for their contribution. Thank you very much. Um, I enjoyed it very much. I learned a great deal from all of you, so thank you. Please give them a big applause. Thank you. Uh, to start with, I want to thank you personally, you in person, I have to say, you as a friend, but also as the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Iraq have been very helpful to us. And without you, this uh, forum would not have been possible. I really appreciate your support and your commitment to this mission. I really thank our panelists, our dear guests who have come from the United States, from Turkey, from Iran, from across Iraq, from uh, Lebanon, from other parts of the world to attend to this forum. It's quite interesting. Today marks the 23rd anniversary of the Kurdish uprising in 1991. On, on this day, on this day in the town of Rania, people rose up against Saddam Hussein and essentially uh, estab led to the establishment of a self-governing uh, territory in this part of Iraqi Kurdistan. And in a way, the rest is history. Uh, it has been a remarkable journey. Uh, we spoke, or Hoshar spoke about the forthcoming event in Halabja, where we will have the head of the uh, uh, international organizations against chemical weapons. I remember in 88, when we were gassed by Saddam Hussein, 5,000 people were killed. Had it not been for our Iranian neighbors, the world would not have known about that episode. That history tells us that we are part of this region. We need good neighborly relationships and we need to work with our neighbors. We are part of this uh, region with the Arabs of Iraq, with our Iranian neighbors, with our Turkish neighbors. And had it not been for the international community's action in 1991 and the establishment of the no-fly zones and then the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, 
uh, with the intervention of the United States and her coalition partners, none of this would have been possible. Today we have a promising uh, venture in Iraqi Kurdistan. We still have problems in the rest of Iraq in Baghdad. But if we could do it in Kurdistan, there is no reason why the people of Basra cannot do it, why the people of Baghdad cannot do it. And again, the promise of this forum, the promise of this institution is to re really be a, a, a place where we can be of help to the various communities of Iraq and to our neighbors. For us to work together, our fate is very much intertwined. We and Iran, we and the Arabs, we and the Turks, each neighbors, we need to work together because there is a lot that binds us compared to what divides us. Uh, again, I really thank every uh, one of you, all those who have been involved with this uh, panel, particularly our student volunteers, our wonderful staff and faculty, and I know none of this would have been possible without the leadership of Dawn Deckel and her amazing staff, and I let Dawn also to express a few words to, uh, to the community here. Thank you, Dr. Barham. So as Dr. Barham was saying, we are not an event management company, okay? And so we did this with a skeleton staff, and it's really because of the volunteers of our students, our IT staff. Dr. Hemon is our MC, Marian Aboud, who has been our heroine the entire time. I just want all of us to give them a round of applause. <laughs> and my sincere... Um, promise to Hosher Zabari that we will do better next year with time management and we will do better with lots of things, less panelists. I promise you we will. So thank you. Next year. Thank you. No questions. That's good. Thank you.